This is Thomas Wayne Riley, and you have found yourself in the American Southwest. Bitter pain is in store for me, but I shall bear it. Beauty beyond all power to convey shall be mine. I will search diligently for it. Death may await me. With vitality, impetuosity, and confidence, I will combat it. Everett Ruiz This is the fourth and final episode in the four-part series over the life, mysterious disappearance, and eternal afterlife of the adventuring wanderer and vagabond for beauty that was and is and always will be Everett Ruiz. If you ain't listened to the other episodes, I suggest you do so before the intro music starts, or else you'll be just as lost as Everett's final resting place is to us. Everett Ruiz had five green adventures in his young life. Two of them explored the California coast and the Sierra Nevadas. He fished, swam, hiked, painted, explored sea caves and mountain peaks. He got blood poisoning and nearly died of shock from countless bee stings. He lived in San Francisco and met famous painters and photographers like Maynard Dixon and his wife Dorothy Lang. He also fell in love with a woman a woman that Western author Philip Fradkin identified as Frances Schirmerhorn. But alas, that love wasn't meant to last, and it had to die with a dying fall, as he put it. A fate our hero may share with his very own love affair. Everett also embarked on three amazing, long, quite unprecedented wandering adventures throughout the American Southwest. From the Grand Canyon to Mesa Verde in Colorado, from the Hopi Mesas to Monument Valley, and from the Phoenix Basin area to Escalante in Utah, he covered more ground on foot, on the back of a donkey or a horse, or by sticking out his thumb, he covered more ground than we can even fathom. And at such a young age to boot, and at a time before that really was a thing that people even did. He saw more beauty than he could bear, as he wrote. And he wrote so well that we get to accompany him on his journeys even today, almost a hundred years in the future. We get to follow him, at least, until they abruptly ended in November of 1934. But before his adventure ended, Everett explored ruins, some seemingly not seen since they were last abandoned. And we talked about these ruins. He even participated in an archaeological dig. Remember that? And on that dig, his fellow artist and dig leader, Clay Lockett, he described Everett as being drawn to the precarious edge of cliffs and enchanted by danger. Lockett said of him, quote, Everett was always anxious to get into situations which provided thrills and excitement. When these situations arose, he would think about them, write about them, or often paint them. End quote. That pretty much sums up Everett right there. In a recent book I received, in between the third episode, the last one, of the series, and this one, the final one, I received a book called The Disappearances, a story of exploration, murder, and mystery in the American West. And the author, Scott Thibony, Tibony, I think it's Tibony, I'm going to say author Scott Tibony, writes about Everett Ruiz. He also writes about two other prominent disappearances in the year 1935 in Utah. And both stories I will tell one day, like on an exclusive Roadrunner episode, which more information on that coming shortly. 
The final disappearance, he writes about in his very well-written book, is about Everett. He quickly sums up what I've already talked about while offering a few more anecdotes and critically, he offers an extremely compelling possible answer, which I will talk about at the very end. I will not solve the mystery, but it is compelling. In regard to the archaeologist Lockett and his interactions with the danger-seeking Everett Ruiz, Tibbany paints a great picture of the risks Everett was taking and quotes from Lockett himself when he writes, quote, Thunder rolled through the canyon below Skeleton Mesa as the sky split open in a violent rain, pounding the slick rock benches. Every crease in the bare sandstone channeled the runoff toward a single nick point on the rim. Within moments, a flash flood leaped out into empty space, plunging into an immense amphitheater of overhanging cliffs. In one sheer drop, the stream fell more than 400 feet before hitting the canyon floor. Everett had to move fast, knowing the storm would end as suddenly as it began. He grabbed his sketchbook and hurried across the wet slick rock along the edge of the precipice. As the rain eased somewhat, the artist found a vantage point on the very brink of the canyon. He worked fast, hunched over his watercolor sketch to give it some protection, trying to capture the wild dynamics of the storm. By now, other members of the excavation crew had left the shelter of the cave to watch the event unfold. Clay Lockett was among them, and Everett surprised him by taking such a chance. As crew chief, he was responsible for the safety of his team, and he found the artist's risk-taking unnerving. Quote, I personally was scared to death, the archaeologist wrote, just watching him perched on the edge of the cliff. End quote. If any single incident can throw light on what was driving Everett, it was the rainstorm on Skeleton Mesa. It shows not only an element of recklessness, but something more fundamental as well. No artist would head into a storm and expect to return with a fine watercolor. Everett took his art seriously and knew he would end up with a rain-smeared sketch at best. That didn't matter. For him, the act of creating was more important than the final result. By risking everything for a painting, he was living up to the image he had created of himself, the artist-adventurer swept up in the great forces of nature. He was on a journey of self-discovery, throwing himself into experiences meant to shape his own life into a work of art, no matter what the cost. He was painting a self-portrait, and the canvas was himself. End quote. And now we know... The cost was his own life. Not long after that rainstorm, as autumn was deepening into winter, Everett was in the land north of the Colorado River, exploring a place the locals simply called the Desert, a place that would become Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. But what was at that time an area rarely, if ever, visited by anyone except Mormon ranchers, Navajo traders, and rugged, sometimes dangerous outlaws, It was a place he would truly be able to explore, to recreate an art, and to be alone, as he often wanted to be. After all, the lone trail is best, as he wrote. It was a place where no one lives, and neither would he. He wrote to his family that after a while, he might go to the town of Boulder, so be sure to post some letters to that little place, and he'd pick them up in a few months. You know, amazingly, I found out in 1934, The Road, Scenic Byway 12, like one of my favorites in the whole world, it's so beautiful, it wasn't even finished yet. It was still under construction. I mean, that's how truly wild this place was. Two months went by without a single word to Everett's family or friends. Not a letter, jot, or tittle. Back in California, Waldo would board a boat for China for his new job, with his mother writing in her diary, quote, Goodbye for how long? Question mark. In the interim, she had hung both of Everett's paintings up in his room in the hopes he would return to enjoy them. And all the while, she was still mailing him letters, not knowing he'd never receive them. Scott Tibbany writes about his mother, Stella, quote, She had fixed a pair of Christmas seals to the back of the envelopes before mailing it, and each displayed a red cottage in a field of snow with the words, Season's Greetings, 1934. 
It was something a mother would do to brighten the holidays for a son who would not be home for Christmas. On the face of the envelope was a cancelled three-cent stamp and a postmark bearing the date of December 22nd. It was addressed to Mr. Everett Ruiz, Escalante Rim, Utah, end quote. By February, those letters, which had been forwarded now to Arizona, were then returned to Christopher and Stella. Their worry, which had been growing, was now justified in its escalation to panic. Until on February 14th, Valentine's Day of 1935, Everett's parents finally reported him missing. They wrote a reply to the postmistress in Marble, Arizona, which is near Lee's Ferry, who had returned the letters to sender. Her name was Florence Lowry. She responded with, quote, I am sorry. I have not seen or heard of your son. I have made inquiry of everyone near here and haven't found anyone who has seen him. She would go on to write. The country north of here is very wild and arid, and it was ill-advised to, of anyone to start without a guide, but if your son was an experienced camper, he will no doubt come through all right. End quote. The Ruises would then send a letter to Escalante, the husband of the postmistress, a local rancher and county commissioner named Jennings Allen, would write back, quote, "We will search for him as though he were our son." End quote. And they really would, three times. All three times they would donate their time and money and take a break from the hard work of ranching and raising a family to look for the wayward adventurer the wayward adventure that they may or may not have ever met as he ambled through their quiet town with his arms around Navajos singing their songs right along with them. I mean, even if they hadn't met him, the people of Escalante and other nearby towns, they certainly remember the Burroughs. I'll quote the late author David Roberts from his book, Finding Everett. He gives a great summation of the correspondence which poured out of the parents to every single person who may have ever come into contact with their son in the American Southwest. It's actually kind of heartbreaking stuff to read. Quote, Between February 11th and 25th, Christopher and Stella wrote letters to the postmasters of every town in the Southwest that they knew their son had visited during his three seasons of vagabondage in the region. They also wrote to the sheriffs of every county Everett had passed through, to Anglo traders on the Navajo Reservation, to Indian agents, forest rangers, and newspapers and radio stations. These anguished appeals typically began, Dear Sir, can you help us? Have you seen or heard of our son? There followed a precise physical description of the missing 20-year-old. In these letters, Christopher and Stella tried to balance their fears with faith in their son's wilderness skills. Quote, Everett is not inexperienced, as he has lived this way in the mountains for four seasons, but not during December and January. He may have traveled into great danger, and we hope you can tell us how to find trace of him. Do you send out notices, or is there a plane that searches for lost people? End all quotes. It seems everyone responded with compassion and a promise to search, but not a one came back with any helpful news, unfortunately. Everett's parents' hearts were beginning to break. But his brother, Waldo, remained, for a time, upbeat. In a letter from China, just days before what would have been Everett's 21st birthday, Waldo wrote, quote, First of all, I want to wish Everett a happy coming of age. This will probably arrive a few days after his birthday, but the sentiments are there. I do hope that I will hear from him sometime this year. I wish I were there. I would certainly go out to try and find him. But since I have had no word from you and your letter is now three weeks old, I presume everything is all right. End quote. Everything, though, was not all right. By now, an L.A. newspaper had picked up the story, which then spread it across the entirety of the United States. This article and this news would eventually reach, on February 22nd, a man who called himself Captain Neil Johnson. And this character would send this in a telegram to Christopher and Stella. Quote, We'll conduct search your request. No Indian scouts. No region well. No water except snow. If lost can be found. 
Snow melts soon. No water. We'll perish. Search must start immediately. We'll conduct search for expenses for Indian scouts only. End quote. Whoever this man was, he certainly seemed to know what he was talking about, and he only asked for money for expenses. So what was the harm? In response to this telegram, Christopher Ruiz, Everett's father, he told Johnson that, quote, We are worried, but not stampeded, end quote. The captain then seemingly invited himself to L.A. and also to stay the night with the Ruises. I know, it sounds strange. And while there, he claimed to have been a pilot for the Mexicans during the revolution, just a couple, maybe a decade before that. Hence, the captain part of Captain Johnson. And he, while he was there, he said he knows the area well on account of his gold-searching days. Oh, he'd find their son all right. All he needed was $75. I mean, for expenses, of course. Neil Johnson was only 30 when he learned of Everett's disappearance, and he was indeed a prospector in those wild and wooly lands. A failed one. But he was a man who had been to the region, and he did know some Indians. What he did not tell the Ruises, though, is that he was also a convicted fraud. Tibbany writes of Johnson, quote, Convicted of forgery, Johnson had spent time in the Utah State Prison and a year after his release got into more trouble with the law. Police in Idaho arrested him for passing a bad check, and when Johnson went on a hunger strike, they threw him into solitary confinement. The punishment broke him. Twice he tried killing himself by bashing his head against the cell bars. A couple of months after his release, he began working placer claims along the Colorado River, attempting to wash enough fine gold from the sands to make a living. End quote. It seems he was not able to make said living, and then he went about finding a new means of revenue, which turned out to be feeding hope to a grieving family. A week later, on the 1st of March, the rancher and husband of the postmistress of Escalante, his name was Jennings Allen, he would gather 12 men on horseback, and they would start off down the Hole in the Rock Road. But before they left, they spoke with the sheep herders, the two, Adlin Lay and Clayton Porter. They were the last people to have ever seen Everett, probably. And with whom Everett had stayed just near Soda Gulch down the hole in the rock road. The sheep herders told the search party that he'd taken off down towards Davis Gulch, which was about two miles south of Soda Gulch. And it's here the posse found in Davis Gulch, the posse found some promising signs of the vagabond wanderer. But first, here's a little bit about Davis Gulch, that place where there, it will become a kind of a, its own character in this episode. Most of what I'm about to read comes from the foreword to David Roberts' Finding Everett. And this foreword was written by the author John Krakauer. And John Krakauer is the author who wrote the book over the disappearance of Chris McCandless in the Alaska wilderness. That book is Into the Wild. You may have heard of it or at least seen the cover or maybe the movie. There's the very famous picture of Chris McCandless that he took of himself leaning up against that bus in the Alaska wilderness. Well, John Krakauer writes of the obscure ravine Davis Gulch, quote, for most of its four-mile length, as I later described the defile and in into the wild, it exists as a deep, twisting gash in the slick rock, narrow enough in places to spit across, lined by overhanging sandstone walls that bar access to the canyon floor. The country surrounding Davis Gulch is a desiccated expanse of bald rock and brick-red sand. Vegetation is lean. Shade from the withering sun is virtually non-existent. To descend into the confines of the canyon, however, is to arrive in another world. Cottonwoods lean gracefully over drifts of flowering prickly pear. Tall grasses sway in the breeze. The ephemeral bloom of a sago lily peaks from the toe of a ninety-foot stone arch, and canyon wrens call back and forth in plaintive tones from a thatch of scrub oak. High above the creek, a spring seeps from the cliff face, irrigating a growth of moss and maidenhair fur that hangs from the rock in lush green mats. End quote. It sounds 
like an incredibly, truly beautiful place, and a place Everett would have sought out and enjoyed. He would have thought it an oasis, his oasis, no doubt. So the searchers, led by Jennings Allen, they find some promising signs of Everett in Davis Gulch. But what they found gets a little mixed up in the record. David Roberts writes, quote, Exactly what the searchers found in Davis Gulch that day, however, remains a matter of controversy. In the early 1980s, several of the searchers still alive reported that as soon as they had reached the floor of the narrow canyon, they came upon Everett's two burrows. A brushwork fence had been built to confine them in a huge natural corral consisting of the upper three miles of Davis Gulch. Some of the men said the burrows were thin and emaciated, but others, including Jennings Allen, swore they were fat and healthy. End quote. So Chocolatero and Leopard were accounted for. But were they skinny or were they fat? And did they even really find them that day? Well, near the burrows, whether they were there or not, near the burrows, the search party found even more signs of Everett. Here's Tiffany to describe what else they came upon. Quote, In a natural alcove not far from the foot of the livestock trail, the searchers also found unmistakable signs of what they presumed was Everett's last camp. Footprints on the ground, empty cans that had held condensed milk, candy wrappers, honest Aussie pot shirts, gathered presumably by Everett and the impression in the dirt of a bedroll. The searchers were puzzled, however, to find no trace of the young man's camping gear, cooking equipment, food, watercolor painting kit, or cash. Nor was there any sign of the journal he had kept throughout the first seven months of his 1934 expedition. The searchers also claimed to have found Everett's footprints, leading to the edge of a cliff, although which cliff? They never clarified. End quote. So to recap, this search party found the burrows, we'll get to that later maybe, found what was possibly his last camp, but did not find any of the important gear he would have had with him at said camp, and they found his footprints. It's also important to keep in mind, those two shepherds, Adlin Lay and Clayton Porter, they would later admit to having gone through his stuff but they never said whether they'd done so before or after his disappearance. So during this episode, lots and lots of stories and evidence will be put forward. But before you get all caught up and excited about the ending, Everett's final resting place has never been found. As of October 17th, two thousand. 23. On the sixth day of this search in March of 1935, a blizzard struck the search party, and this blizzard would cast even further doubt that Everett could still possibly be alive. Surely, if he was out there, he would not have been able to last through such very rough and cold weather. When the burrows were discovered, uh, there was discussion on what to do with them. Do they leave them there so that if Everett returned, he'd have them to make his way back to civilization? Or do they bring the burrows back to Escalante so they don't starve or go thirsty? In the end, it was decided that Gail Bailey, a local, would herd the two, uh, Chocolatero and Leopard, back to town. But taking them back wasn't as easy as leading them with a rope. Tibbany explains, quote, when the horsemen attempted to drive them out of the canyon, the animals locked their legs on a smooth pitch and refused to climb. No one was able to persuade them, so two riders roped the burrows and dragged them up the sandstone on their sides. This raised the possibility that Everett had faced the same problem, forcing him to delay his travels or to leave them behind with the expectation of returning. End quote. Had his two trusted companions been complicit in the disappearance of Everett Ruiz? And so, I'll mention it later again, but it seems Gail Bailey, the man who decided to take the burrows back up to Escalante, he may have already taken them back before this party even came down there. I am still not sure. There seems to be some conflicting accounts, which is true for a lot of this stuff. 
But there are so many possibilities and possible answers to the question of what happened to Everett Ruiz. That's what makes the mystery so exciting. After ten days of searching, the party headed home. And then not long after, Jennings Allen, the man who kind of got that first search party together, in June of 1935, he sent a letter to the Ruises that said, quote, The consensus of opinion seems to be that Everett did not cross the Colorado River onto the Navajo Mountain. There was a man camped at the hole in the rock from about December 6 until sometime in April, who seems positive that had anyone come to that place, he would have seen them. In viewing this country, you would agree that it is unlikely anyone could cross the river at that point without being seen by a party camped there. End quote. Of course, the identity of this mystery camper man has never been definitively discovered. But a man who camps throughout the winter alone in this much of a wilderness is sure to not want to be discovered. I say definitively because a carving on the wall on a wall, a sandstone wall, found years later, may indeed reveal this strange wanderer's identity. Very near the actual hole, in the hole in the rock, is carved Quinn R. Roundy, December 12, 1934, February 35. Roberts writes of this revelation, quote, Nudged by a transcription of this graffito, local writer Jerry Roundy, a distant relative of Quinn, the author of an excellent town history called Advised Them to Call the Place Escalante supplied some context. Now quoting Jerry Roundy, quote, Quinn would have been herding sheep. He wasn't the owner. He would have been working for somebody else. Sometimes they had a sheep wagon, and they'd stay out there all winter. If Quinn saw Everett, I never heard him say so. End all quotes. Maurice Cope. The Bryce Canyon head ranger who had housed Everett for a few nights at least, or maybe longer, along with his nine other children. Well, Maurice Cope was a little troubled and puzzled by this second party's findings, and he would write to Christopher and Stella, quote, The fact that his burrows were fenced in and his camp outfit is not to be found is evident that he has a permanent camp somewhere. The most reasonable thing for me to believe is that he in some way crossed the river to the east side, or attempted to cross. If he did not cross the river, I cannot understand why he left his burrows. Near where his burrows were found are deep canyons, and in them are signs of cliff dwellings. There is always danger in attempting to climb up to them. I am very concerned, and no doubt there is some need for alarm. If he established a camp somewhere with the intention of staying until spring, everything will be okay. If anything has happened, it would no doubt be some kind of accident. End quote. You know, so he cannot understand why he left his burrows, but maybe the burrows didn't want to go anywhere, so they had to be dragged up by a rope on their sides. At this point, at least to his parents, I doubt it mattered if Everett's disappearance was the result of some kind of accident or because of his burrows or even the doings of a malcontent. Or maybe if he decided to live with the Indians, that's a possibility, as we will discover. Either way, their boy was still missing, and probably approaching presumed dead by this point. Stella, in her diary on March 8th, wrote, quote, Radio said Everett may be hopelessly lost. End quote. Waldo, who was apparently ever the optimist, wrote to his parents on March 25th, quote, I hope he is found. He ought to get good publicity out of that. And with his writing ability, capitalize on it and write magazine articles. End quote. Ah, if only. Despite the acting U.S. Secretary of War promising Everett's parents that the U.S. military will look for him during their training exercises, no search was ever made in the air by any branch of government for the missing adventurer. With all the canyons, though, and caves and alcoves, what good would an aerial search have been? Maurice Cope, the head ranger at Bryce, pretty much told Christopher Ruiz that same sentiment. But intriguingly, Maurice also told them, quote, he intended to visit with the Navajo Indians after reaching the other side of the river, end quote. That's a thread we should unravel. But first, 
what about this Captain Johnson fellow who come over and asked for the $75? Well, despite them writing him a telegram, them being his parents, despite his parents writing Johnson a telegram, calling his whole search off and begging for their money back, Captain Johnson marched forward throughout all the land, and all the while he would send word back from, seemingly, all four corners of the American Southwest. He'd write from Salt Lake City, Cortez, Colorado, Holbrook, Arizona, Blanding, Utah, and a slew of other locales, not really anywhere close to wherever it disappeared. The closest may have been Hanksville, Utah, which is near Gobham Valley and Factory Butte, off of Highway 24. It isn't too far from Capitol Reef, which does border Grand Staircase, but it is still a world away from the canyons of the Escalante. A world away, and the Henry Mountains away, and tons more canyons away. From Cortez, Colorado, though, Captain Johnson would write in barely legible English, quote, Reached here this evening. I stoped several times to communicate with different Indians of different trading posts along up through New Mexico and Arizona, also Colorado. There is several that knew of Everett. One chief told me today, Picture man hip, savvy wild mountains. Okay. Nevertheless, I was unable to get any information from them concerning him nothing more than hip, okay, picture man. He make picture for Indians. He would go on to write, Still do not believe that Everett is in danger unless he gets abandoned from more than any one of the Indians because they are loyal if they are your friend. Most of the Indians know of the paint man, which is Everett. They say his yabby toch, which means fun, good humor. End quote. Then, later, from Blanding, which is a really nice town in eastern Utah, and it houses Edge of the Cedar State Park and Museum which is a fantastic Anasazi, Fremont, Ancestral Pueblo, and Great House. It's got amazing artifacts in it. You should definitely check it out if you're over there. Well, from Blanding, Captain Johnson would name three of his Navajo scouts, and they are as follows. Sidno, or Sydney, Bully Chaho, and Butch Nash Chaho. He would write of them that they weren't charging him anything, just expenses, and also that these Indians are friends and trustworthy because they once had pneumonia and he had somehow saved them. So they were loyal. That's what he was saying. Well, sure, Captain, if, if you can make it happen. On April 8th, he'd write from Blanding again and he'd say, quote, The latest report is that it is of their opinion that your son is with two Indians, both Navajos, and that they have headed for the camp of Hostin Buchesia, a Navajo Indian that lives near Navajo Mountain. The two Indians and the white man seem to be very clever in avoiding seeing, or letting anyone see them. Hostin Buchesia is an old Indian, and he knows most everything that is known about the Navajo tribe. I asked one of my scouts what percent of chances did Everett have of being alive. He held up his hands with only one finger turned down. Nine to one. End quote. If this guy wasn't taking advantage of the Ruises during this tragedy, he would absolutely be a character worth studying. But make no mistake, dear listener, he was a charlatan. This was all a ruse against the Ruises. But he kept it up well, and he would stick around for a long while. In one letter to Everett's parents, he wrote, quote, I wish that I could write like Everett. It is a God's gift. What a delightful letter to write to a boyfriend. The wilderness, the out of doors is ever. It's God, his soul, and his heart is raped up in it. I envy him. I wish I could take his place and let him come home to you. End quote. Maybe bashing his head against them cell bars jostled something loose in there. He was barely literate after all. And obviously, as we've heard, Everett was a wonderful writer, so the sentiment makes sense. That's all kind of just sad. One of the captain's plans was to fly over the area from Moab, which is not a close distance. And while flying, he planned on dropping leaflets that Everett was sure to pick up. But, he mentioned in the letter about this flight, quote, Don't forget to instruct the pilots to bring an extra parachute. I do not like to fly without one over a rough country. End quote. 
<laughs> of course, that flight did not work on account of the country being too rough. But then, despite being sent more money by the Ruises, his next plan also didn't work. And then the next, and the next, etc. Until he finally sent word to Christopher and Stella that their son, or at least a white man among the Navajos, had been found. But he, quote, don't want to be bothered, end quote. Captain Johnson wouldn't be the last con man, a hole, to dupe the grieving Ruises either. Roberts wrote of this, quote, For years after Everett's disappearance, a procession of sociopathic and, and or delusional informants would surface, offering stunning revelations about Everett's fate or his secret existence, end quote. Obviously none of them came to fruition. I will talk about a few of them, but not all of them, because there really is just a bevy, there's a plethora of reports. At about this same time, a third and quite robust search was started by Ray Carr, and he was the head of the Associated Civic Clubs of Utah. They raised some money uh, from uh, pretty much the entire area of southern Utah. This party left in late May of 1935 and headed further down Davis Gulch than the previous parties had dared. And on that search, they made two discoveries that kept the story and mystery of Everett Ruiz alive. On June 5th, Carr, the leader of the party, telegraphed the Ruises to say, quote, Does word Nemo have any significance to you found carved in cave? End quote. They found what now? While exploring a spot in the lower part of Davis Gulch, the team found more footprints which they followed up to some Anasazi Fremont ruins. And then among the ruins were some ceramic shards, pot shards, piled up as visitors often do. You know, when you go to some of these sites, you kind of like sift through the dirt and you see all these beautiful painted pot shards or just corrugated pot shards from broken pots. And it's like a innate desire to just kind of look at them and then kind of all place them in what I think David Roberts called an outdoor museum. So... They found a pile of potsherds, no doubt, made by Everett. Then, on the steps leading up to the entrance of the ruin, the team found, carved into, I think, just the plaster, Nemo, 1934. They then found another Nemo, 1934, written in charcoal at the base of a Fremont pictograph panel, not far from these ruins. So they'd found one of his last written words, and it was scrawled into a step leading to the entrance of a cave that held Indian ruins in Davis Gulch. And those words were Nemo, 1934. Everett's mother's heart must have leapt out of her chest at this revelation, because she knew exactly what that meant. She immediately wired back, quote, Everett read in desert Greek poem Odyssey, translated by Lawrence of Arabian Desert. Here, Odysseus, Greek word for nobody, Nemo, being Latin word for nobody. Odysseus, trapped by man-eating giant in cave, saves life by trick of calling himself Nemo. Everett dislikes writing his own name in public places. End quote. Did Everett possibly take on another pseudonym? He hadn't in a few years, since he was much younger at least. But he didn't ever really scratch his own name into any sandstone that's been found yet, that is true. I mean, at this point, I could tell you all about Odysseus and Polyphemus, the Cyclops, and how he stabs him in the eye and calls himself no name and tricks the Cyclops and then escapes from the cave under the bellies of the sheep. But I don't think that is why Everett called himself Nemo. I think his father's interpretation of Nemo is more accurate. And here is a uh, quote from David Roberts to kind of clear up this Nemo from 20,000 leagues under the sea. Later, Christopher realized that Nemo also echoes Captain Nemo, the misanthropic antihero of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, a well-thumbed copy of which Everett had read more than once. In the novel, after hunting what they thought was a giant sea monster all over the oceans of the world, the protagonist, the learned Professor Aronnax, and his two companions are taken captive on the captain's mysterious submarine. There is a vivid moment when the three men first meet their jailer, 
In all likelihood, Everett felt a deep identification with Captain Nemo's proclamation. Quote, I'm not what you would call a civilized man. I've broken with all of society for reasons which I alone can appreciate. I, therefore, don't obey its rules. End all quotes. That line alone. I'm not what you would call a civilized man. I've broken with all of society for reasons which I alone can appreciate. That's Everett. That is our wandering vagabond for beauty, who once said, quote, My friends have been few because I'm a freakish person. End quote. I mean, there are a bunch of other quotes that I can't remember at this time that echo this same sentiment, but that's, it's Everett. There's another reason I lean towards him taking on the name Nemo from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but I will get to that at the end of this episode. Only a few decades after Everett carved and wrote these two Nemos, the rising water of the abomination that is Lake Powell would cover obliterate, and forever disappear these last hints of Everett. Although, there may be other Nemos to find. On June 21st, 1935, after the three unsuccessful searches, Everett's parents set out on an automobile trip from L.A. to northern Arizona and southern Utah. By now, they had probably given up hope of finding Everett alive, and instead they were just looking for his echo, his shadow, the traces of him that still barely lingered. They brought with him paintings he had sent back to follow in his trailless footsteps. They not only wanted to see the places he knew and loved and had traveled so extensively to, but they also wanted to meet the people he had met and interacted with and journeyed alongside. Stella would keep a diary uh, from this trip, and actually years later she would write a short story from the passages she kept. Their first stop was in Cayenta, which was also usually Everett's first stop. There, they met the legend John Wetherill and his wife Louisa, and their son Ben. I mean, all three had known and probably enjoyed the company of Everett. Ben had, after all, been on that archaeological dig well, that I talked about in the last episode and at the beginning of this one. And John had shared a lot of wisdom with Everett. Stella wrote that the weather rails told her that Everett was, quote, very happy last September, end quote. And that was the last time they'd all seen him. During their visit, John also told Everett's parents that he thinks as soon as Everett would have been done going down the hole in the rock road, he would have crossed the Colorado and then explored Wilson's Mesa. Apparently, Wilson's Mesa to this day is one of the most inaccessible places in all of the American Southwest. At that time, no one had gone looking for Everett on that desolate place. The following day, his parents left the weather rails and headed towards Navajo Mountain Trading Post. But, along the way, they ran into a Hopi man named Edward Nekwatewa. After this incident, Edward would write a letter to his parents, which would outline what he told Christopher and Stella. And this is what he said, quote, what Navajos that I had talked with from the Navajo Mountain said that they had never seen Everett or any white man around there at that time, nor there was never any searching party come around there. Others, the Navajos, would be talking about it. They also said that if Everett has met his foul play in that region, it won't be by any Indian. If this Johnson really had sent these Indians out on searching party, he certainly would have some reports from them. End quote. So we're back to that con man, Captain Johnson. Even John Wetherill was of the opinion that this Johnson fellow was B.S. It looks like Christopher and Stella were slowly coming to that realization as well. Although not fast enough. From Navajo Mountain, Everett's parents drove to Zion National Park. And then over to Escalante. The entire trip. People who had met or who knew Everett provided their thesis or ideas on where he might have gone adventuring before disappearing. Some said he went to live with the Navajos. Some that he probably drowned floating the Colorado River. Some even said he made a makeshift raft. The leader of that first search party, Jennings Allen, he would take the parents about 42 miles down the extremely difficult hole-in-the-rock road 
he would take his own automobile. And that's kind of impressive. Even I had to turn around on the Hole in the Rock Road in April of 2023, and I have a four-wheel drive truck. But there were car-sized potholes filled with water and an incoming snowstorm just pouring off 50 Mile Mountain. It was beautiful. I imagine it was infinitely more difficult back then and the automobiles they were using. Stella would write in her journal about the road and how it stopped their continued advance and their search, and she said, quote, We wished that we had wings to fly. End quote. This was really, this trip was really the parents' first non drive through of the American Southwest. Stella and Everett and Waldo had stopped at the Grand Canyon all those years back, but that didn't really count. This was their first true visit to see the places that their son had dedicated his life to. The place I am practically dedicating my free time to. The place that enthralls so many from all around the world. The place Everett gave his life to. Stella would write about it, quote, From the Navajo Bridge, we thrilled at the deep gorge of the Colorado. We thought we recognized the very view Everett painted, and which we called On and On and On, as printed on a folder with his wilderness song. We saw many sheltered spots where Everett probably slept, and the impressive amphitheater of great rocks with a drapery of green foliage and a natural pulpit in a pool of water. We felt sure that Everett had declaimed some well-loved lines to the surrounding Vermilion Cliffs. End quote. She's probably right. It's hard for me to imagine their grief and sense of loss. I mean, we've all lost people, but a child... That's something all entirely different. And to be more unsure than knowing, that must also be frustrating on top of the heartbreak. Eventually, Christopher and Stella realized the ruse this Captain Johnson was playing on the Ruises, and they refused to send any more money. I mean, they also accused him of being a con man who was taking advantage of them. And all of this was no doubt true. Although, we're about to see that he's going to get some things right, so it is very strange. On June 1st, Captain Johnson sent a letter to the parents filled with righteous but ultimately, you know, nonsense indignation. Quote, I cannot hardly believe you said it. The report was that you said you considered what money you had sent me was a loss that you considered I had used it for my own use. I do not need that kind of money. Blood money. If ever it was dead, which I believe he is not, he would haunt me. If he was alive, he would haunt me. End quote. Either way, it seemed this man was going to be haunted. And again, not to frustrate y'all, but Christopher eventually wrote back and said, I will pay you $25 to bring back a written note from Navajo Mountain proving that my son is alive. And you better believe that charlatan accepted it. By July 3rd, Everett's parents were back in L.A. Their journey east to the southwest Hadn't yielded their son, but maybe it had brought them some catharsis. About a week after they arrived, though, a certain preacher Smith from Blanding, Utah, sent a letter to Christopher and Stella saying that Everett was living with them in their town and among his congregation, but that he may have, quote, lost his sense of identity through some blow or fall in amnesia, or he may be broke and too proud to communicate, end quote. That quote is from Everett's father's journal. That story, like so many, would not pan out in the end. But around the same time, a much more plausible, if not horrible, answer began emerging. In early July, Christopher and Stella were informed that a body, a badly burned body, burned beyond all recognition, had been found in the desert near Gallup, New Mexico, which was near the border of Arizona on I-40, although at the time it would have been 66. So the police and Gallup asked for Everett's dental records to see if they could match them up. After some agonizing waiting, the Ruises received the records and then sent them on. But unfortunately, this nearly cremated corpse was not Everett. The dead man was missing no teeth and had no metal fillings both characteristics that described our 
Vagabond for Beauty. Eleven days after the chief of police in Gallup informed them that the corpse was not their son, Everett's parents received a letter from Captain Johnson. It said, quote, I am leaving here in the morning for Navajo Mountain, where I will stay until Everett is found. Mr. Ruiz, I hate to say this, but there is a boy living with a bunch of Navajos in the vicinity of Navajo Mountain. He has had a tribal wedding. I am most sure this is Everett. End quote. I mean, at this point, you have to wonder. Was this guy just straight up making this stuff up? At what point do you bail and count your winnings and move on to the next con? Or is all of this actually real? And it just so happens to not be Everett. Or is it him after all? In the summer of 1935, the Salt Lake Tribune would print an article detailing the many, at this point, disappearances and crimes and murders and kidnappings that seemed to be flooding the Beehive State. And this was a shock to many of its residents. Everett wasn't the only disappearance. And in other areas of the state, the Navajo and Ute were quote-unquote acting up. It was a seemingly dangerous time. The Salt Lake Tribune would publish in relation to all of this, quote, It remains a strange world, inhabited by strange characters whose actions are a constant worry and surprise to their fellow men. End quote. It is true. It is a strange world. And someone like the strange character that is Everett does give constant worry and surprise to those who knew him. Shortly after that was published, in August of that year, the Salt Lake Tribune would mount their own, their very own search party. And surprisingly, Captain Johnson would be on it. Probably. Maybe. Enter John Upton Terrell. John Upton Terrell was a Western historian, and a popular one at that, who also worked as a reporter for the Salt Lake Tribune. Later, after his time in our story, he would go on to write over 40 books, many of them biographies, and many of them over characters and people I already plan on covering, or have covered, like Cabeza de Vaca, whom I have talked about twice now. He also wrote on John Wesley Powell, someone I will talk about, and Zebulon Pike, Another person I plan on talking about much, much later, since essentially he and Powell and Everett are just wanderers through the Southwest, but each have their own unique adventure that I think are worth telling, just with some time in between them. John Upton Terrell has been compared to Zane Grey by author David Roberts, and I will indeed cover Zane Grey soon enough, but all of that writing by Terrell was yet to come. For the Salt Lake Tribune, John Upton Terrell agreed to go on an assignment and write about this lost artist and free spirit. I'll quote Roberts in his summation of the headlines and articles that followed. Quote, The results of the inquiry, in dispatches written by Terrell, were published on the pages of four successive issues of the newspaper between August 25th and 28th. The first dispatch, printed at the top of the front page of the Sunday morning edition on August 25th, under the headline, S.L. Tribune Expedition into Desert Finds Clues to Fate of Young Artist, opened with a bold proclamation of the team's unshakable conclusion. Now he's quoting the article. Everett Ruiz, 21-year-old missing Los Angeles artist, probably met death at the hands of a renegade bad man or Indian in a lonely canyon near the southern end of the untracked Escalante Desert. This is the united belief of the best Indian and white trackers, traders, and wilderness residents of southern Utah and northern Arizona. Their conclusion is based on several trails of evidence, which to the men trained in the ways of remote lands are almost irrefutable. But also, these expressions of opinion have come following an extensive and intensive search by an expedition sent out by the Salt Lake Tribune, and which has practically exhausted other possibilities. End quote. Now it's back to Roberts. To buttress its claims, the Tribune published a map of the terrain traversed by the searchers. It covers an impressive swath of country stretching from Blanding, Utah, to Tuba City, Arizona. From the Navajo Mountain Trading Post, Terrell's company, including Indian guides, worked its way northwest by pack train through some of the most rugged and seldom visited canyon lands anywhere in the southwest, finally crossing the San Juan and Colorado Rivers to arrive at Davis Gulch. End all quotes. Wait a minute, didn't the Hopi man who ran into Everett's parents, didn't Edward Nequatewa 
Didn't he say that there was no way an Indian hurt or killed Everett? And anyways, how dangerous to white men or Anglo-Americans were Indians in the 1930s anyways? Wasn't that all in the past? I mean, sure, like a lone crazy Indian or even a crazy white man could have gotten a hold of him, but what was their evidence? Well, the team apparently had an expert Navajo trail reader named Dugai, who was actually Paiute, but... But this Doug guy said not only did the tracks they find eight months later, mind you, I mean eight months, eight months and you're telling me no monsoon or winds or other walkers or horses or burrows or anything, nothing scattered or dispersed or destroyed or disappeared these tracks? Well, you know, anyways, Doug guy told Terrell that with these tracks, there were six of them that he saw, but the tracks told him that, quote, white boy come in, not go out. End quote. In all honesty, Doug I should know that one of those horse trails were his when he left and went into Escalante to trade, which he had done. But how did they know that Everett met a violent end? Well, duh. Terrell knew the way of the Indians, especially Navajo, and he knew, quote, A Navajo Indian cannot keep a secret. He reveals all such things to traders and agents. End quote. <laughs> you see, Terrell knew the secret of the Navajos. They were constantly drinking truth serum, and they just had to spill their guts lest their noses grow or something. I don't know. That's all just kind of ridiculous, really, looking back. So from here, I'm going to just quote a large section from Robert's book, because he in turn quotes a lot from Terrell's article, and he just does a great job. It's, it's riveting stuff, truthfully. So here is the long quote. The mystical climax of Terrell's search came in a hogan near Cayenta, Arizona where the reporter's guides led him to the camp of a Navajo medicine man. I have forgotten the Indian's name, Terrell wrote. It was, for me, unpronounceable. He was, however, Natani, which means wise man, or sometimes head man. The old man's wife was a renowned seer. After the requisite sharing of cigarettes and gossip about the latest Indian policies of Washington, as Navajos refer to the federal government, Natani suddenly asked, Why have you waited so long to look for your friend? And for the first time, the medicine man's wife spoke, almost inaudibly. Far north. As Terrell's party watched Spellbound in the rainy night, Natani began to chant, while his wife covered her face, then started to sculpt a mound from the sand on the ground. Twice she destroyed and rebuilt the topographic model, which Terrell's guides recognized as Navajo Mountain. Eventually, she used a finger to draw a pair of crooked lines enfolding the peak, signifying the San Juan and Colorado Rivers. The chant ended abruptly. Natani's wife sat with her head fallen, breathing deeply, as if she were very tired. The rain stopped. Natani spoke. Go to the forks of the rivers. Guide. He lives there? Natani. He was there. Close by he made a camp. You will find the fire. The guide. Have you seen him? He meant like in a vision. Natani. He has gone away from there. Guide. He is dead? Natani. He has gone away and does not mean to come back. Pressed by Terrell's Navajo guide and translator, Natani made a last effort to see Everett. At last, he spoke. There is a shadow. Only some of his outfit was moved away. There is more someplace. I see him talking with two friends. They are Navajos. Young men like himself. They sing and eat together. Then there is a shadow. He has gone away. The Navajos have left the place. They are no longer with him. She says they may have traveled together. He has given himself to our gods. He has taken us in his arms and wished to come among us. The vision of Natani and his wife directed Terrell to Navajo Mountain, where he recruited Dugai, then visited the junction of the Colorado and San Juan rivers. The tracker scrutinized the riverbanks, then spoke. White boy not camp here. Onward to Davis Gulch, and thence to further consultations with Indians and Anglo cattlemen. The cloak-and-dagger melodrama of Terrell's dispatches obscures the fact that the search, for all its, quote, extensive and intensive, end quote, apparatus, was little more than a flamboyant wild goose chase. Terrell's conclusion, moreover, was not so much a QED as a grasping at the kind of straw that might sell newspapers. The closing passage of the last dispatch, for all its air of certainty, seems to acknowledge silently that Terrell's party could not identify Everett's alleged killer or even come up with a convincing motive for such a crime. This is the result. Everett Ruiz was murdered in the vicinity of Davis Canyon. 
His valuable outfit was stolen. He never reached the Colorado River. But some day, we said, pieces of his outfit will turn up. Then we would take the trail again. The gripping accounts in the Salt Lake Tribune made a big splash. A Utah Department of Justice agent prepared to make a case before federal authorities to launch a manhunt for Everett's killers. The state governor promised to open an official investigation. To their credit, however, Christopher, Stella, and Walda refused to swallow Terrell's detective work whole. As of September 1935, they still hold on to the hope that Everett was alive. End all quotes. So Scott Tibbany and the disappearances also talks about this John Upton Terrell Salt Lake Tribune incident or, you know, story. And in it, he says that Captain Neil Johnson and John Upton Terrell actually interview John Weatherill in Kayenta. And this is, uh, so this is a quote. Reaching the trading post at Kayenta, he interviewed John Weatherill, and the trader gave a blunt assessment of the fate of the missing artist. Dead, he said. End quote. And uh, Scott Tibney also talks about Natani. So I'll just quote real quick. In his reporting, Terrell recounted a dramatic moment when he reached the camp of a Navajo headman that evening. Having forgotten his name, the reporter simply referred to him as Natani, taken from Naatani, meaning speaker. His interpreter told the Navajo that the white men had come to their friend who had disappeared six months before. Yeah, end quote. So Natani just means speaker. And even though he's not named, it does seem like Captain Johnson is on this expedition, or was. So by 1935, there were essentially four theories on Everett's fate that had coalesced around his disappearance. These four theories are still the four most plausible ones today, almost 90 years later. The first one was the one we just covered. Murder, either by a bad white man or a bad Indian. A theory had even been floating that a cattle rancher had killed him or a cattle rustler, or a group of rustlers. There were a bunch of them out there, after all. Or, what if a Mormon cattle baron didn't want his daughter to marry a wandering vagabond Gentile? Bud Rusho, author of A Vagabond for Beauty, focuses quite a bit on this murder theory, surprisingly. Then again, he did write it something like 40 years ago. The second theory was that he was actually still quite alive, but was just hiding. That's what his mom, dad, and brother believed. And it isn't all that far-fetched, really. I mean, okay, it is, honestly. But, I mean, think of all the quotes I've read so far from his own writings and his letters. Think about him describing in detail how much he hates cities and how he never, ever wanted to return to them. The only thing he ever found that he liked in cities was Frances. And she's gone. That died with a dying fall. It would make sense if he said to hell with it all, I'm turning Navajo and I'm never going back to the filthy, boring civilization again. The great Western author, Edward Abbey, would write in Desert Solitaire in 1968, quote, For all we know, he is still down in there somewhere, living on prickly pear and wild onion, communing with the gods of river, canyon, and cliff. End quote. He was being somewhat facetious, but still, I mean, it could have been a reality especially in 1968. While he was doing his own research, author John Krakauer, the author of Into the Wild, who I've talked about already before, uh, he wrote about Chris McCandless and his misadventure in Alaska. Well, Krakauer was also an Everett cult member, and while writing a chapter on Everett in his book, he was told by a man in Kingman, Arizona, that he knew Everett was still alive. He was living with a Navajo woman and their child on the Navajo reservation, and it wasn't a secret. Much later in the 90s, that same author, John Krakauer, would track down someone I'll briefly mention later, and they'd talk about how they thought Everett met his fate, and this man would tell Krakauer, quote, Everett was a loner, but he lacked people too damn much to stay down there and live in secret the rest of his life. A lot of us are like that. I'm like that. Ed Abbey was like that. And it sounds like this McCandless kid was like that. We like companionship, see. But we can't stand to be around people very long. So, we go get ourselves lost. Come back for a while. Then get the hell out again. And that's what Everett was doing. Everett was strange. Kind of different. 
But him and McCandless, at least they tried to follow their dream. That's what was great about them. They tried. Not many do. End quote. The author of Vagabond for Beauty, Bud Rusho, seems to agree with that man and Krakauer. Quote, From his letters, it appears that he remained too close to his parents and to his brother Waldo to suddenly and deliberately cut all communication forever. End quote. Regardless, sightings and rumors of Everett's living trail would swirl throughout the Southwest for decades to come. Personally, I don't buy it for the same reasons I just quoted. He liked people too much, and he loved his family way too much. And he liked meeting artists, and he liked other adventurers. Plus, he would have had to give up painting and photographing and writing and music. It just doesn't fit. The third theory is one I struggled with at first, because he just left so many dang hints towards it. And that theory is that he chose to end his own life. Remember him finally sending money to his parents? I mean, that was the last clue. I mean, why would he need their money if he knew the possible outcome of his upcoming final desert jaunt? Think of all the other quotes I've read, too, like, I've become a little too different from most of the rest of the world. Or, I was sorry, though, that her intimacy, like many things that are and will be, had to die with a dying fall. Not necessarily that part, but this part. I do not greatly mind endings, for my life is made up of them. Or what about what I would have missed if I had ended everything last summer? Or the most damning one. And when the time comes to die, I'll find the wildest, loneliest, most desolate spot there is. Of course, these may just have been poignant writings from a lost wanderer and not words of intent. But he was occasionally filled with loneliness, sadness, melancholy, and contempt for mankind, as we have read and as you've heard about. Now a lot of that I do think is because he was a teenager, and it seemed like the older he got, the easier it got for him, as it is for most everyone. In the year 2000, a reprint of On Desert Trails, which was a companion to Bud Rusho's Vagabond for Beauty, and which included more letters and more or I guess a lot, of his journals, well, it, too, was written by Rusho, and it included an afterword by a man named Gary James Bergera, and it was titled The Murderous Pain of Living, Thoughts on the Death of Everett Ruiz. And in that afterword, Bergera makes a pretty sad but strong case for Everett's suicide when he writes, quote, For many readers of Everett Ruiz's remarkable letters home, a terrible melancholy permeates almost every line. End quote. He then assembles a lot of the quotes I did as well, but he goes on to write, quote, What emerges from a careful review of Everett's writings is a portrait of a gifted yet depressive young artist whose tortured engagement with life both powered his creative expression and propelled him toward his own self-destruction. End quote. At the same time, though, as Rusho said of this theory, quote, He was not a recluse. He liked to converse with everyone he met, end quote. But he also says, Whatever his feelings upon leaving the cities, his letters indicate a gradual return of confidence and good humor, end quote. Even Everett's parents, Christopher and Stella, had pretty much, well, not come to this same conclusion, but had flirted with it. I mean, to completely argue against Bergera, Roberts writes, quote, The last letters home have been too full of joy and enthusiasm to spring from a youth contemplating suicide, end quote. And I uh, tend to agree. Despite sometimes during my research and reading, thinking it may have been how he ended it, in the end, I think, for the same reason that he wouldn't disappear and live with the Navajos, he wouldn't choose to end it all himself, because he loves life and beauty, and he loves his family too much. He may have said he'd seen more beauty than he can bear, but he always seemed to be able to bear more. The fourth and final theory is that an accident befell him. Or really, in my opinion, if this is what happened, he fell during an accident. And that would also make total sense. It actually might make the most sense. Think about the many times he himself had bragged about tempting fate, or think about when others spoke of him nearly plummeting to his death. If you've wandered enough in the wilderness, 
Death does present itself to you in one form or another, more than once. And Everett spent an enormous chunk of his life in the wild. It could have been a severe and debilitating bout of poison ivy. It could have been a rattler bite that infected his blood. Heck, bee stings that infected his blood. He's almost succumbed to that. He's almost succumbed to dying from a wound in his hand. He could have drowned, frozen to death, got swept away in a flash flood. Although the whole 80-year drought thing does disprove that a little, except for the fact that a very heavy rainstorm inundated the area shortly after he left the sheep herders. And that will be important at the end. To me, the accident that makes the most sense if he did go out in an accident is that he fell. He was climbing to some Anasazi ruin or to get to some vantage point where he could paint or ride or just explore. And he fell. And he hit the deck and died instantly or was smashed into some crevice where he slowly bled out or starved to death and deteriorated or he fell in some slot canyon and was washed away in summer or... I mean, I don't want to get too morbid. There are numerous ways to accidentally meet your maker in the wild and woolly American Southwest. To highlight some of his own writings that talk about his own rather proud carelessness, here's some quotes from Everett. In my wanderings this year, I have taken more chances and had more and wilder adventures than ever before. It may be a month or two before I have a post office, for I am exploring southward to the Colorado, where no one lives. Yesterday, I did some miraculous climbing on a nearly vertical cliff and escaped unscathed, too. One way and another, I have been flirting pretty heavily with death, the old clown. But, as I thought, and that's the end of the quote, but, as I thought, and as Rusho and Roberts writes about, he wouldn't have taken all his stuff up somewhere to look inside a ruin, right? His painting kit? Sure, yeah. But his mess kit? Everything? That seems silly. And not like something he would do. To me, it's either theory three or four. Suicide or accident. Or maybe he committed suicide by accident. Maybe all accidents in the wild are a form of suicide. You don't take risks like he did unless you are willing to die in the first place, really. Something in you says, bad freaking idea, and you retreat from the ledge. Unless you believe living without the adventure isn't living at all. Truthfully, I don't believe he committed suicide on purpose. Maybe I did sometimes while reading, but I think he accidentally fell to his death. Although, murder is still a very possible outcome. On September 24th of 1935, Everett's father, Christopher, wrote to a friend, quote, If ever it is dead, he has truly lived, and more than most people do in a century. End quote. So apparently, although he was not named by Terrell, the old coot Captain Johnson was indeed on the search mission with the journalist and the Paiute dugout. After the unsuccessful mission, though, the captain paid yet another visit to the Ruises at their home in L.A. Christopher Ruiz would write to Waldo of this and say, quote, he sleeps in Everett's bed, and I in your bed right now. End quote. Mm-mm, I don't like that. I'll be honest. In his diary, Christopher would write this of their interaction with the con man. Quote, Johnson says that his brother slept with Everett his last night in Escalante. Slept with meaning camp aside. And that Everett had nearly $1,000 in bills. Sounds fishy. No way of telling what money Everett had. Johnson, full of fairy tales, had an idea Everett took a package of photo plates really drugs, for drug smugglers from New Mexico to Bryce National Park, and was paid $1,000 for that. This is absurd. For it took Everett weeks to go that distance, and I think Johnson just told it to me to get me to bribe him to keep Everett from being prosecuted. End quote. As crazy as that sounds, I mean, Everett drug smuggling? Well, first of all, I don't think he even went to New Mexico on this trip. No, he went to the Lucachu guys, didn't he? That's on the border. You know what? He may have gone to New Mexico on this trip, or at least the border of it. But 
I mean, everyone from Waldo to Christopher and even Stella were wondering where on earth that money had come from that he had sent them. And what did he mean in one of his final letters he wrote when he said, quote, I have more money than I need, end quote. When did he ever have more money than he needed? And who would he sold his paintings to? Again, like I mentioned in the last episode, what Mormon rancher on the border of Arizona and Utah would have donated or bought all that artwork from the wandering vagabond that is Everett Ruiz? Waldo had already written about this when he said, quote, Have you ever learned the exact source of Everett's money? It seems to me he never did tell us just how he, or when he got it. End quote. Christopher would respond to Waldo's letter with, quote, I believe Everett must have met some well-to-do people who paid generously for his pictures. End quote. Again, during the Great Depression, some well-to-do Mormon rancher, art aficionado out in the farming communities along Highway 12? That just seems unlikely. But still, what seems even more unlikely is that Everett was a drug smuggler? In a series of letters between Waldo and his parents around November of 1935, the three discuss some of the possibilities that befell Everett, mentioning all four I just discussed. His father even mentioned, quote, he says that if he had shuffled off his mortal coil a year previously as he discussed with you, he would be missing all the great experiences and beauty that at that moment he was recording, end quote. So suicide had crept into his parents' imagination as well. But Waldo dismisses the suicide, although he does raise two of the other possibilities when he wrote, quote, from what he had said, I might believe that he would commit suicide and that he would drive himself on in a stoical manner, not always being considerate of his bodily needs until he starved to death or from not caring for wounds properly. But I doubt if he took life in such a way as to be willing to hang a rock around his neck and jump into Colorado. I might think that he fell down some chasm, but that is not certain because if that was so, his belongings should be around somewhere at least. It certainly seems like someone might have done him in. End quote. I think right there, Waldo just brushes against the most likely answer. Falling down a chasm. And then, as we'll discuss, maybe somebody took his belongings. But still, the other two, suicide or he ran to the wrong person or persons in a place where no one lives, are still very plausible. It's easy for us to armchair detective this story, which happened so long ago. But to his parents, Christopher and Stella... This was all very real and happening in very real time for them. Christopher's journal on November 13th, 1935 reads, quote, Dreamed of Everett, saw his skeleton. Mother dreamed of him and saw him stalking into the kitchen the other day, tall, healthy, with sweater with Indian symbols on it, saying, Well, here I am. End quote. His father would eventually wonder if maybe he made it to South America or even across the Pacific to China. But Waldo couldn't fathom it and wrote to his father what is likely the truth. Quote, As many of his poems and writings lead one to think that might happen sometime, he has undoubtedly driven himself beyond his physical endurance and died, beautifully and alone in the desert. Whether he suffered or not at the time is a moot question, but it was a beautiful death because he was living a life of beauty. A life of doing what he wanted to do. End quote. He would also write, kind of heartbreakingly, quote, As I think about him, I begin to realize what a poor excuse for a person I am. What a shallow, empty life I am leading as compared to him. End quote. As you'll shortly hear, though, Waldo does not lead an empty, shallow life but will become, in fact, an extremely accomplished and cool-sounding dude in his own right. And maybe that's partly due to his brother's disappearance. Over the next few years, they would get more sightings and more people would come forward to suggest they could prove he was alive. But, of course, none would pan out. The Ruises would search for the truth in fortune tellers and card readers and astrologers. A seer would tell them he drowned, for it was written in the stars at the time of his birth. They'd consult handwriting specialists to see if he was still alive writing under a pen name somewhere. Another woman suggested he was possessed by a demon or a devil, but it won't last forever, and he'll be normal and return when that being that had taken him over, when it leaves him again. 
I guess anything's possible in the devil's desert. Hey, that's the name of my forthcoming novel. Strangely and rather cruelly, in 1938, a friend of the family wrote to Stella and said, quote, Just before we moved in 1936, Everett came to visit us a couple of times. He acted differently and often spoke of going back to Mexico. And at one thing he said to us, I chided him and said, Everett Ruiz. Then I noticed something strange about him. He asked us, Is that who I am? I do know that when we asked him of his parents, he always said, I have no family. Bless you. I do hope this helps ease your dear mind and do give up now. Release your sweet loving mind from this double thinking. For really, Stella, darling, wherever your boy is, he's in God's loving care. And that's all we need to know, isn't it? End quote. Why would you write to your friend like that? It's absolutely false, and she knew it. I have no family. Everett would never say that. Everett deeply loved his family. And to tell that to Stella, and then to say, do give up now, that's just cruel. By that same year, 1938, Christopher and Stella had a small part of them that actually did still believe he was alive. And out there going by an alias in the Four Corners region, they begged Everett through letters and ads in the area to meet with them, even if it was only just once, for however brief. But he would never appear. Later that same year of 38, a writer out of Palm Desert, California, who wrote for something called Desert Magazine, he published an article titled, Say That I Kept My Dream, which of course was a line from Everett's wilderness song. The author, Hugh Lacey, began the article with the line, quote, Wherever poets, adventurers, and wanderers of the Southwest gather, the story of Everett Ruiz will be told. His name, like wood smoke, conjures far horizons. End quote. And that is quite the prescient prediction. Although it is a real shame and a mystery that I hadn't heard of Everett before this series, with all my wanderings, I practically have mirrored him in some ways. And now maybe it's for the best that I didn't know about him. Someone like Everett and his story has the power to change people's lives. I really do think that. I probably wouldn't be where I am at now if I'd have known about him earlier in life. I would have pursued a much crazier path. I do believe that. But with this article by Lacey in the Desert Magazine, the beginning of the cult of Everett Ruiz was born. After publication, hundreds of people would write the magazine asking for more information on who this Everett Ruiz was. In that original article by Lacey, uh, he also writes this of our vagabond adventurer, quote, He was one of Earth's oddlings, one of the wandering few who deny restraint and scorn inhibition. His life was a quest for the new and the fresh. Beauty was a dream. He pursued his dream into desert solitudes there with the singing wind to chant his final song. End quote. I kind of can't help but sense the similarities between the phrase desert solitude and desert solitaire, which is the book by Edward Abbey, who was a cult member, and he published his book 33 years later in 1971. Lacey, though, would follow up that first article with another one in December of 1939, titled, What Became of Everett Ruiz? This obviously reignited interest while also causing a flood of new sightings. One of these sightings was by a woman named Cora Kegel, who swore that when she was on vacation in Mexico with her husband, on the drive back as they passed through Monterey, they saw a white man who showed them his quote-unquote portfolio of watercolor paintings, which he said was his livelihood. He also said he was living amongst the Indians in Arizona. In that first article of Lacey's, he had printed pictures of Everett, and the Kegels, upon returning to Cali and reading the Desert Magazine, they instantly recognized Everett. He was the one they'd seen in Mexico. Cora Kegel, in turn, wrote a piece for Desert Magazine, and she closed it by saying, quote, We are convinced that we saw Everett Ruiz, and if it was Everett, he was tanned, healthy, and happy, and several pounds heavier than when he disappeared. End quote. Nothing would come of this sighting. Another man wrote to the Ruises saying he saw Everett and his dog Curly, the one that ran away and never came back, you know. 
but he said he saw Everett and Curly in Florida at a transient camp. And I think that's messed up. The dude used the long gone dog's name, too. He just completely made up the whole story. Some people can be cruel. Despite all that, though, Christopher would correspond with this man for four more years. Hence why these people do this kind of stuff in the first place. I mean, they just get attention. They feel important. Eventually, Christopher thought maybe that Everett was on a seven-year Odysseus-style journey of his own. And in 1941, Everett would dramatically return. But as David Roberts points out, Odysseus was gone for 20 years. And for half of those, he was fighting in the Trojan War. What war would ever be fighting? But, as if he'd conjured it, in that very year of 1941, something rather dramatic did indeed happen. In Tibbany's Disappearances, he writes about a string of incidences in the year 1941. Quote, An unusual number of enemy way ceremonies, more than two dozen, were taking place in the Western Reservation in 1941. Reports had filtered in to traders and Indian agents about medicine men using the scalp of a white man in their ritual. The victim was said to have been killed in the 1930s beyond Navajo Mountain, and the circumstances suggested a connection to the missing artist. End quote. Tibbany goes on to describe how the Navajo word for scalp, which is the item needed in the enemy way ceremony, may not actually be a scalp, but may just be a remnant of the dead person, like hair, bones, or even pieces of clothing. But sometimes, a real human scalp is actually used. And when that happens, a small piece of the scalp, in use, is cut off to be ritually destroyed at the end of the ceremony. And this ceremony is used to get rid of something called the ghost sickness. Which I have brought up before. And it can be contracted after a Navajo is exposed to the physical remains of a dead person. The ghost sickness can kill you quickly, or it can give you cancer. Blindness, bad luck, any and all sorts of misfortunes, essentially. Tibbany writes, quote, Soldiers returning from war have had the sing performed to exercise the ghosts of slain enemies, and sometimes children returning from boarding school have undergone the ritual purification. End quote. During the 40s, there were a lot of enemy way ceremonies taking place on the Navajo Res, and eventually, the authorities were called in. Here is yet another extended quote from Tibbany's Disappearances. An investigation began, and the authorities soon tracked down multiple scalps. One of them had belonged to an Anglo killed while traveling alone on the rim of Tsegi Canyon a quarter century before. A trader linked another scalp to an even older incident, the killing of a white man on a sandbar in the San Juan River around 1882. Then, the investigators learned of an active case involving John Chief, a 51-year-old Navajo living south of the San Juan River who was respected by his neighbors and the local traders. Earlier, he joined a delegation that traveled by train to Washington, D.C. to protest the stock reduction program that was hurting their people. The delegates had pawned their jewelry to cover expenses. The Navajo Police Patrol and the Federal Bureau of Investigation staked out an enemy way being held near the Old Hedo Trading Post. The scalp of an unidentified white man, said to have been killed by John Chief, was being used. End quote. The authorities would then go on to arrest John Chief, but in the end, it was indeed his son in law, who was already in custody, who had committed the murder of this white man. And that man's name, not the white man, but his son in law's name, was Jack Crank. Besides needing the scalp, Jack Crank, just plain old, quote, hated white men, end quote. While being held in a Phoenix jail for this murder and taking of the scalp, Jack Crank would tell the authorities the unspeakable. The man he murdered for the enemy way ceremony had been Everett Ruiz. In the end, Jack Crank was never tried for Everett's death, and the authorities even told the Ruizes not to believe the Navajo man. But Christopher and Stella, heartbroken, tired. They would end up believing him anyways. Maybe it was the easy thing to do after almost a decade of wondering. Finally, an answer presented itself right in front of them. Somebody had actually confessed. 
Christopher would write the head of the Navajo agency saying he opposed the death penalty for his son's murderers, but life in jail should be good enough. He also begged him to force the men to show them where they'd buried Everett's remains, and to please hand over the diary so they could publish it. E.R. Fryer, the head of the Navajo agency, would write back and say to Christopher, quote, We are convinced that these men, murderers by their own admission, had no part in the disappearance of your son. End quote. The two men would get ten years behind bars, although the judge hoped they'd soon be released after an appeal. The Navajos had wanted an acquittal. The Ruises, though, they would go on believing the Navajo renegade, and in 1952, 1952, so quite a, 11 years later, Christopher would write to one of Everett's friends saying, quote, Crank was a sort of outlaw among his people, even. He was probably drunk when he did the deed. For us, this seems to solve the riddle. End quote. Now, while he said that, they still entertained the possibility of other outcomes. In reality, the man murdered had been a 50-year-old destitute prospector named Shorty, who was believed by the Navajo to have broken into a hogan. Oops, Everett. But Shorty was believed to have broken into a hogan and stolen some flour, coffee, and tools. And on top of that, his horses had eaten all the corn and destroyed the field of a Navajo family. This was just too much for the struggling people. So to answer for his crimes, John Chief and Jack Crank rode out and dispensed some frontier justice on the hapless wandering white man. Hence, why the Navajo had wanted an acquittal and why the judge in Monticello had been so lenient. Crank wasn't the only Navajo to have claimed to have seen or even killed Everett. In the 90s, on a hike to Navajo Mountain, Tibbany was speaking to his Navajo guide around a campfire when he mentioned Everett Ruiz's disappearance. And to the author's surprise, his guide told him the riveting story of exactly how Everett was killed. Tibbany writes, quote, He looked directly at me, surprised by the question. Yes, he answered. My father-in-law told us a story last fall. He said it happened somewhere between where we were camped at Harris Wash and the Colorado River. It's a story only the locals know. Down by the creek, a hobbled horse hopped twice and stopped as if listening. Some Navajos met him out there, he told me. They were on their way to Escalante. One of them decided to take his livestock. He tracked him back to his camp. He killed him with his own axe. He didn't take the animals. He felt guilty and left them there. He buried the body in a crack and covered it with rocks and sand. He hid his tracks and didn't tell anybody about it. He spoke about it for the first time four or five years later at a squaw dance. End quote. So occasionally, a part of the enemy way ceremony is called the squaw dance. And that's what he was referring to. And the enemy way is what I just mentioned earlier about getting rid of the ghost sickness. After the tour around Navajo Mountain... Tibbany had permission to come back and interview his guide's father-in-law, the one who told the story. But when the time came, the man backed out. And on the phone, the guide said, quote, It wasn't my father-in-law. It must have been one of the elders. End quote. Eventually, after talking to more Navajo elders, the consensus came back that the story he had been told around the campfire was wrong. And it must have happened elsewhere to someone else. This story, by the way, is, as you will hear at the end, like the most plausible murder story that exists. After all, Everett knew some Navajo language and some Navajo songs. He had been invited to a healing and a song. He had seen the sand paintings. He had chased ghosts out of a dying woman. He had been told where Hogans were and that he could use them. He wore a turquoise bracelet made by a Navajo. Then there's the Navajo wife picture. Even Christopher had mentioned that the final time he had seen his son Everett, that Everett had been walking like a Navajo Indian man. So murder is still a possibility. And the case was turned into a murder investigation. And that was serious. And we'll return to that again. After the two Lacey articles in the late 1930s, 
the editor of the Desert Magazine, Randall Henderson, would go on to publish Everett's writings in 1940. He'd title it, On Desert Trails with Everett Ruiz. This was, would have been the first book published about Everett Ruiz. In the foreword to the book, he wrote, quote, This book is offered not merely as entertainment, but as an intimate picture of a very intelligent young man who sought in his own way to find the solution to some of the most difficult of the problems which confront all human beings in this highly complex age. We cannot all be wanderers, nor writers, nor painters. But from the philosophy of Everett Ruiz, we may all draw something that will contribute to our understanding of the basic values of the universe in which we live. End quote. The book, this, this first published book about Everett Ruiz, became a minor classic, apparently, and it was still in print until very recently. The cult was growing in 1940. And one of these cult devotees was a man named Harry Aylson. At 40 years old, Harry Aylson would quit his job in the Midwest and move to a shack at the western end of the Grand Canyon. And he did that after falling in love with the American Southwest. The place really has a hold on people. By the early 1940s, though, Aylson was leading commercial trips on Lake Mead, while also, in his free time, exploring the rapids of the Colorado through the canyon and beyond. But not just the Colorado River. He also explored many of its tributaries, including the Escalante River. And not even just the tributaries. He also would explore up the canyons and even on top of the mesas around the canyons. This is how he enters our story now. Because in 1946, when he was doing just that, exploring the tributaries and canyons and mesas, he headed up, you guessed it, Davis Gulch. And during that hike, he climbed a sketchy Anasazi hand and toe hold ladder up to a cliffside set of ruins rarely seen. But at least one person had seen it since the ruins were abandoned. On the doorway of the ruin was carved, Nemo, 1934. This finding was like a lightning bolt, and for the next few years, Harry Aylson would search far and wide for Everett. The paper, the Deseret News, would say of him in 1948, quote, Perhaps no man living has spent as much time in searching for traces of the lost young man as has Harry Aylson of Richfield, Utah. End quote. He not only cared deeply for the mystery of Everett Ruiz, but he also sought the answer to many other mysteries of the region. It turns out he had wanted to be a writer, but it had never panned out. Regardless, he sleuthed and searched and wrote and kept every scrap of paper he ever collected, and then when he died, he left it all to the Utah State Historical Society, where apparently his efforts still help researchers and writers today. But while he was still alive, he ended up becoming pen pals with the Ruises and eventually offered to take them on a tour of Davis Gulch. Stella, at 68 years old, took him up on the offer, even though it would be a tough and a trying adventure for her. So Stella and a friend drove from L.A. to Richfield, Utah, and there they were given a tour of the area. And then, the two of them, with Aylson and his assistant, Sterling Larson, they all drove the entirety of the Hole in the Rock Road, all sixty-something bumpy washboard miles of it. They then hiked for hours across the sandstone towards Davis Gulch. Stella would write this about the journey, quote, Okay, but actually, first, before I quote Stella, I must admit I have been saying a word wrong this entire time. I don't know how many episodes. I've been saying Mokwai steps when I should have been saying Moki steps. Thank you, dear listener, who pointed that out. Okay, Stella wrote, quote, We got down into Davis Canyon to the Willows and Box Elders before noon and then had sandwiches and juice and beer cans. Then we started down grade to the canyon bed, struggling through young willows that were dense and scratchy. Finally, we turned and came upon a circle of red mountains with a high window, i.e. arch, and below it were about 30 Indian pictographs, dancing men, lizard, etc. Harry's name and some of the first searching party were written in the wall with charcoal, so Lou and I added ours. Finally, 
We saw the Moki house high up the canyon wall with an arched overhang. Lou and Sterling stayed below, because he had leather shoes. Harry climbed up first, then came back and said, I can make it. He stayed below me and pointed out each crevice, Moki toe holds, where I could put one foot in the other while bracing my hands against the sharp slanting wall. By the time I reached the shelf, fifteen feet wide perhaps, I felt pretty shaky, because I thought it would be much harder to get down. Here, there were quite dim pictographs, and the one Moki ruin without a roof. Two steps led up to the door still where Nemo and 1934 are scratch. Harry and someone else added their dates. I took two small pottery pieces, and Harry cached below several pieces from a good-sized cooking bowl. End quote. While she didn't mention the emotions that she must have felt upon seeing her long-gone son's writing on the wall of the Long gone, mysteriously disappeared culture. I can almost see the writing of Everett in her recounting of the tale. Maybe she meant to do that deliberately. Or maybe Everett learned how to write from her. It's also pretty amazing that the 68-year-old woman climbed what was probably a, a 5'8 or even a 5'9 on the climbing scale. I mean, maybe. I haven't seen it. And that's scary desert sandstone stuff. And that's, I mean, that's easy way to, to fall, just to ask her son. That is truly awesome, though. And thankfully, she did make it down with some coaching. But they couldn't make it back to the truck that night, so they just slept under the stars. How very Everett. Harry Aylson would later say of Stella that she was the, quote, bravest of courageous women, end quote. I'd say. That night by the fire, Stella would write in her journal, quote, Harry and Sterling kept the fire going all night, and Harry talked about Everett until 11.30. He discounts every theory except that Everett fell from a cliff. End quote. And most of the time, that's also my belief. And it's also the belief of Harry Goulding, who had by then founded Goulding's Lodge near Monument Valley. A great place. And it's also what John Wetherill, the amateur archaeologist and explorer and awesome dude, thinks. And when last episode I said John Wetherill had a patch on his eye, but it's actually his son, Bill, that has the patch on his eye. But Christopher Ruiz, his dad, Everett's dad, when not waffling on if he was murdered or not, would occasionally also think that he fell. He actually wrote in 1948, the year of this excursion, while he was at home and his wife was with Ailson. Well, he wrote to Ailson and said, quote, it may be that Everett met his end in such a fall. It may be he drowned crossing the Colorado, as Mr. Henderson of the Desert Magazine uh, came to believe. It may be that he was killed by the Indians for his gear, unlikely. He may have fallen and suffered amnesia, forgetting his identity. Or it may be he planned to disappear without a trace and lose himself among the natives, and he may be in Central or South America or Mexico now. For all these theories, there have been believers." End quote. And I mean, I'd even say that Christopher has been a believer of each and every one of these theories, actually. While Elson may have clung to the theory that he fell, and while that may have been what he told Stella, he would have a few differing opinions in the very near future. So it's time to return to the possibility that he was murdered. Starting in 1951, three years after the excursion with Stella, Harry Aylson began thinking of some other possibilities. He wrote to a friend and former client who worked for Deseret News and said, quote, During the past four to five years, I have been hearing rumors on the disappearance of young Ruiz. I have heard some very bold statements. Names have been named. Certain persons living in the area today are not only suspected, but practically accused of the murder of Ruiz. With no substantial proof, of course, nothing can be done. I have all the names. For the present, I am waiting, hoping for a deathbed confession. For some years, I have known the men most concerned or suspicioned. I have talked to them often. I have good reason to continue the suspicion. End quote. He told his friend, This statement that, he just, that I just read was in all caps, NOT FOR PUBLICATION. And then yet another desert rat, an amateur American Southwest historian. Wait a minute. Am I a desert rat, an amateur American Southwest historian? Uh Uh-oh. 
Well, anyways, one of Harry Ailson's close friends, who also loved the desert and its history, a man named Otis R. Doc Marston, was on the trail of Everett's disappearance with Ailson, and on December 14th, 1952, Ailson would write to Marston in the strictest of confidences and say, quote, I heard firsthand on Pearl Harbor Day this year some startling statements from a man of that area pretty much in his cups. The boy was shot. Killer was named to me. Killer died seven years later. Two others threw the body in the Colorado R. Both are living. One served time in Utah Penn for wrestling. I've been seeing and talking to him off and on for several years. For some weeks now, he has kept a room here in Richfield, Utah. Not more than 20 feet between our beds. Nothing, re the murder, could be proved in court. While the parents, whom I know, are living, I'm inclined to say nothing. Let the secret of the disappearance die with them. What would you do with this knowledge? End quote. In his cups, by the way, means drunk. Well, to answer Ailson's question, Marston told him to send this info pronto to Randall Henderson, who was the editor of the Desert Magazine, who published that first book on Everett. Ailson would then do just that and would write a coded top secret message to Randall Henderson describing the murder by these local wrestlers in Escalante. And he again ended it with the hope of a deathbed confession. After that message to Henderson, Ailson would write down every single thing he knew about the murder and or disappearance of Everett Ruiz. But he would do it in a very Ailson, top secret confidential for your eyes only kind of way. When I first wrote this up, I had I was going to read like his entire very strange coded message, which is just like a thing that's all caps and everything's smushed together. It's very goofy. But uh, if you want to read it, you can go read uh, David Roberts' Finding Everett Ruiz. He has the whole little deciphered abbreviated code in there. But in this message, Ailson names names. Names like Adlin Lay, Hugh Bailey, Emerin Alvey, Keith Riddle, and Joe Pollock. And all of these men were local Escalante ranchers. Heck, you may remember Adlin Lay's name as he was one of the sheep herders who last saw Everett alive and who confessed to going through his stuff. Hugh Bailey had been the man in his cups, or a little drunk, who had told Ailson all of this. And in this coded message, Ailson fingered Emeron Alvey as the killer. But he had died in 1944. Lastly, Keith Riddle and Joe Pollock, Alvey's accomplices, had disposed of the body, apparently, in the Colorado River. So Ailson had gone from he fell in an accident to he was murdered. Maybe there was foul play after all. Surprisingly, this goofy coded note of Ailson's wasn't read or published until 1999, a total of 27 years after Ailson's death. At that time, author David Roberts says, the original telegram piece of paper, the coded message, it was at the Utah State Historical Society, but it has since been stolen, most likely by some crazy cult member. At least it was recorded, though. So how plausible was this theory? I mean, for all we know, it could be the truth. By 1953, a few months after the coded telegram to and from Ailson, Waldo, Everett's brother, he had left China and had been stationed in Indonesia and then El Salvador. But he was now back, at this time, in California. That year, the editor and publisher of On Desert Trail, that first book about Everett Ruiz, the publisher Randall Henderson, had recently heard from Ailson about the possible murder. He would write to Waldo and let slip some of the confidential, as Ailson put it, rumors, that were beginning to swirl out in the desert of Escalante. Quote, Two years ago, camping on the Kaiperowitz Mesa overlooking the Escalante River basin, I had listened to the story of a couple of Mormon cowboys, story that, while not conclusive, was an acceptable solution to the mystery. They believe Everett was killed by a couple of cattle rustlers whose names they know. Their story was entirely plausible, and as far as I am concerned, it is the solution to the mystery. End quote. Now, it is not known if Randall Henderson heard the story himself like he just described, or if he was just passing on what he'd read from Ailson. 
At that same time, still in 1953, Salt Lake City newspapers began running stories about a recently found but quite old camp filled with a year's supply of canned food. One of the headlines read, 20-year-old mystery revived. Discovery of old hideout gives clue to lost artist. Ailson sent these articles to Christopher and Stella, but told them that this was probably not Everett's, since a year's supply of food was not what he had with him. But at the same time, he wrote to them, quote, Assuming that someday we do learn the facts of Everett's disappearance, possibly through a deathbed confession, to what extent would you, Christopher and Stella, want to know the details? For some years now, I've had the thought that we are going to learn. End quote. Obviously, Christopher immediately wrote back with, quote, We would want to know everything, but we hate the idea of general publicity, though it might be desirable to influence others not to venture on the Indian lands without realizing what risks they take. An Indian drunk or sober might well get the idea of vengeance on any white man. Everett probably realized that he was taking his life in his hands. End quote. So Christopher was definitely referencing Jack Crank with this response. But it could be that he had heard of the other Navajo murders by this time. Shortly after writing that letter to Ailson, though, in 1954, at 75 years old, Christopher Ruiz would pass away after complications with some operations. He would be the first person truly close to Everett who would finally learn the answer to the mystery of the disappearance of his own son. According to Sella, 500 loving friends attended the service. After Christopher's passing, his other son and Everett's brother Waldo would take on the mantle of being the finder of the truth to the Everett Ruiz mystery. But things weren't going to get easier to discover. In 1956... Some prospectors found a skeleton very near the hole in the rock road, on the banks of the Colorado River. Ailson wrote Stella and Waldo and said, quote, At this time, there's a 50-50 possibility that the remains of Everett have been found. End quote. But according to the Garfield County Sheriff, the remains were not a match. And the body was ruled out as being the remains of our vagabond wanderer. The reason for ruling it out are unknown to this day. The very next year, in 1957, as the rising waters of the ill-advised Lake Powell began to rise... Don't get me started on Lake Powell, seriously. But in 1957, as teams of archaeologists attempted to scour every possible nook and cranny and crevice of that immense and massive canyon system for any and all possible... Sites, ruins, finds, mummies, artifacts, etchings, petroglyphs, etc., etc., etc. As archaeologists attempted to save the history that laid in the path of the rising and soon-to-be radioactive waters, as archaeologists dissected every inch of the area, they came across an old camp near the mouth of Cottonwood Canyon. Cottonwood Canyon is the canyon on the south bank of the Colorado River that is directly opposite the Hole in the Rock. It's the way the Mormons came in 1880 after they crossed the river. It's the trail mentioned previously that Everett may have followed. It's one of the most remote places in the nation. Well, in this camp, the archaeologists found a spoon, a fork, a cup, some pans, a canteen, and some razors made by the Owl Drug Company, which was based out of Los Angeles. So, that very same Garfield County Sheriff that deduced the remains I just mentioned weren't Everett's, he sent some of these findings to Stella and Waldo, and they realized, no, there was no way these were Everett's, on account of him never having shaved himself. He would always have barbers shave him instead. Remember I mentioned that? Shave and give him a haircut. Waldo, in 1960, would write to the sheriff of the county I was married in, Garfield County, and he would fill him in on his thoughts, which were that Everett had fallen to his death on accident. He'd write, quote, Even if he only broke an arm or a leg, in a remote canyon no one would have known of it, and he could have starved to death and eventually been covered over by the shifting sands. End quote. But he would go on to entertain the other rumors, too. Quote, I certainly wish someone could get to the bottom of all this. 
If my brother met with foul play, by this time whoever did it must have suffered plenty from remorse over the years. There would be no need or use of punishing them now after all these years. End quote. That's a rather forgiving outlook, really. And I'm not sure the state would agree. At this point, the cult grows, the legend of Everett Ruiz continues. People come and go throughout the Ruiz's lives, offering hope and answers and books and screenplays and... I mean, some of these people help. Some of them hurt. Some are total creeps with no teeth. Some are friends or acquaintances of people Everett ran into, or they knew Ailson, or they heard from an Indian firefighter of a white man among the Hopi who has long hair and dresses like them. One man, another desert rat like Ailson, a man named Ken Slight, who influenced the writer and adventurer Edward Abbey, he found another Nemo carving in a place 40 miles east of Davis Gulch at a place called Grand Gulch, and that is on Cedar Mesa, near the Bears Ears. Grand Gulch is filled with Anasazi ruins, and is an amazing and remote area still to this day. I don't really know what to make of that Nemo carving, truthfully. Maybe Everett made it over there and then drowned on his way back in the San Juan? Maybe he made it over there and then on his way back he fell. I don't know if the Grand Gulch Nemo is real or if it's a fake. One man pops up in the story, the toothless sad man I just mentioned, and he would take the 1931 journal from Waldo and Stella, as well as some letters and photographs, and he would promise some massive book which he would publish, but he would never deliver nor would he ever return the journal or the letters either. He, this man, Larry Kellner, it's the reason we don't have that 1931 journal. And he creeps me out to read about too. I had written extensively about all these guys and their ties to the story. I had planned on talking about all of them. But if I did, this would just be the longest episode. So many dead ends. So many loose threads. If you would like to know more, I suggest you enter the cult, read the literature, and enjoy the mystery and the story for yourselves. Plus, I would lose a bunch of y'all to these names and dates and people that are ultimately unreliable and who just muddy the Everett waters anyways. I will say, Larry, the toothless man, he did say some Navajo called Everett Yabitosh, which is the same name Captain Johnson used to describe Everett. But there's no way anyone could know that Captain Johnson had told the Ruises that. So that is interesting. What white man was out there in Navajo country going by the name Yabitosh who painted for the Navajos? Hmm. But again, ultimately Larry Kellner, the toothless sad man, he disappears with the writings and the journal and pictures and the letters from Everett. And he is a weirdo. By 1964, 30 years after the disappearance of his brother, Waldo was 54 years old, and he was extremely interesting as a person all by himself. He too was quite the wanderer. He spent more time outside the U.S. than in it. He'd been to China, Japan, India, the Soviet Union, Morocco, Algeria, Sudan, Iceland, Norway, France, Spain, Burma, Cambodia, Mexico, Canada, over 100 foreign lands, as he put it. His brother would be proud. Waldo spoke Mandarin, Spanish, Russian, French, and a few other languages. He was an international businessman and diplomat. He married a gorgeous Spanish woman in 1957, because, unlike Everett, he had no problem speaking to women, although I think maybe Everett would have grown out of it. By 1964, Waldo had three children of his own, and he would have a fourth later. In that same year, 1964, Stella was 84, and she was recovering from a stroke at home when it came time for Mother's Day. Waldo would write this of that fateful day, quote, Conchita, and that's Waldo's wife, Conchita had given Mother a good breakfast, which she enjoyed, And then the children came in and sang, Happy Mother's Day to you, dear Grandma. 
she, the while waving her arms as if conducting a choir. Then she dropped her arms and slowly faded away. Thus, her passing was as sweet and poetic as the manner in which she lived. End quote. Now Waldo was the only Ruiz left who truly knew Everett, at least as much as anyone could have truly known the wanderer. After Stella's death, the anger that was building in Waldo about having given the writings and pictures to Larry Kilner, that toothless man I mentioned, that anger would grow, and for the next 18 years, Waldo would try and track down this weird little sad man who was hoarding the all-important Everett writings. Waldo would write letters begging him to return the stuff. He'd try and track down an address. He would call and talk to this guy's mother. Nothing was working. Even by the 1980s, he still had not found out where this creep was. But he was willing to buy back the stuff he and his mother had lent this strange biographer, who never biographed. Waldo was now wanting those letters and journals so that he could give them to Bud Rusho, the man who successfully wrote another source of mine, A Vagabond for Beauty. Surprisingly, Larry actually did write back 18 years later, mind you. He did not mention ever receiving a single letter or call or anything, and instead said his dad had died and his mom was sick and he was just looking for a job. This dude absolutely sucks, like bottom-of-the-barrel garbage man. Then to top it all off, in a later letter he claimed he never even received a single piece of writing or picture. In the end, Waldo and Bud offered Larry over a thousand dollars for the material and for the information he'd gathered over the years. But it wasn't enough money, and behind Waldo's back, this guy, this pest, he sold everything on Everett that he had, including his writings, to a Santa Fe book dealer for three thousand dollars. It then got sold to a dealer in Salt Lake City in 1988, a book dealer. Waldo tracked this guy down and asked for the stuff to be returned, but he said it was all copies. I mean, what what was going on? Larry was never heard from again, and in 2009, David Roberts tracked down this Salt Lake City book dealer who said he had sold it all to a cult member in Indiana, who will one day apparently donate it to a museum. Oh, how infuriating it was to read all of this, by the way. Just a whole chapter of infuriating backstabbing and selling and lying. Roberts ends that chapter with this. Quote, In 2004, however, at the age of 95, Waldo attended the first Everett Rubis Days Festival in Escalante, a celebration that would become an annual event. With him were his wife, Conchita, and three of their adult children. There, the family met the Indiana Collector, whose name, unfortunately, none of the Ruises can remember, the man greeted Waldo warmly and posed for some photographs with him. According to Waldo's daughter, Michelle Ruiz, he came across to me as awkward and shy. He felt he had obtained the papers in an honest manner. He learned from us that they included stolen property, but he didn't feel any compulsion whatsoever to right the wrong. Apparently, he had paid dearly for them. After meeting him, I felt that future endeavors to have our property returned to us would be futile. End quote. Waldo's son, Brian Ruiz, adds, quote, At one point, he indicated a willingness to donate the papers to the University of Utah, but he had some kind of plan to use the materials first, for a book or a movie or both. He coyly refused to give our family any access to the materials until after he had finished his project. End all quotes. Those papers are still somewhere in Indiana as of 2023, as far as I could glean. If you're listening, please just release them, man. Upon the author Edward Abbey's insistence, you know, that's the desert solitaire writer, really great, interesting character as well, and a great book if you haven't read it, but upon Edward Abbey's insistence, Gibbs Smith and Bud Rusho will make the book A Vagabond for Beauty, which is also a fantastic book, and it has lots of examples of Everett's writing, some pictures of Everett, and then the end is like the mystery, kind of like my episodes. Kind of like most books that talk about Everett Ruiz. This book, by 2002, had sold over 100,000 copies. At first, it barely sold 2,000 of its 10,000 copies in the 80s. But slowly, as the cult grew, the book sales took off. The co-author, 
Gibbs Smith sums up why he thinks Everett's writing took off so much when he said, quote, Everett, in my opinion, was the first unscientific appreciator of this land. His letters are still the best expression of why we so appreciate the beauty of this landscape. End quote. I mean, he is absolutely right. But at the same time, I hope, dear listener, that I am continuing on in this practice of unscientific appreciator of the beauty of the American Southwest. And I hope I am passing that on to you as well. I kind of hinted earlier that in Rusho's A Vagabond for Beauty, he focuses more attention on the murder angle than any other angle. So yet again, let's dive a little into that mystery. While Rusho was in Escalante doing research for his book, he would learn that during the time of Everett's disappearance, cattle rustling was such a huge problem that in that very same year that Everett disappeared, 1934, he learned the Cattlemen's Association began spreading false rumors that a government spy had been sent to the American Southwest and sent specifically to that area of southern Utah. And he was there to investigate and to try to catch rustlers red-handed. What if the poor, kind-looking young man with his two lowly burrows who walked like an Indian was mistakenly identified as the spy? Russia would write, quote, It was into this atmosphere of deceit and suspicion that Everett innocently rode his burrows south from Escalante. Of course, Everett must have looked about as dangerous as a puppy dog, but who can account for the possible reaction to him in the mind of a petty thief? End quote. Russia would also learn that a local rancher had actually bragged that he was the very same one who killed Everett. But when Russia went to interview him, he wrote that his memory was, quote, suffering from old age. He did remember that a young artist had disappeared near Davis Gulch, yet he said that he knew absolutely nothing about the incident. End quote. Russia left the man unnamed. In the end, Russia concludes that, quote, we are left without a final answer, only riddles within riddles. End quote like an Anasazi spiral. Russia would then write that the mystery wasn't what made the cult so popular, but instead it was Everett's life that everyone wishes to emulate and preserve for posterity. He writes, quote, His love of wilderness, his sense of kinship with the living earth, his acute sensitivity to every facet of nature's displays, all of these, because of their intensity in one young man, gave Everett rare qualities. What made him unique were his reactions to the striking and dramatic landscapes of the American West. End quote. Those reactions he wrote down and sent and recorded are the same reactions I had and still have when I see the landscape of the American West and Southwest. I sometimes notice that I've even written in my old journals nearly the same description of the places he visited word for word. And that was long before I'd ever heard of Everett Ruiz his life or his mystery, or read his anything, poems, journals, letters. But I am obviously now fully a member of the cult of Everett Ruiz. Despite the whole toothless Larry stealing so much valuable words, Waldo, the ever-trusting man, eventually handed over everything to Gibbs Smith in Russia. I mean, thank goodness he did. He did trust the right people this time. The publication of A Vagabond for Beauty in 1983 was the true lasting monument to Everett that the family had always wanted. Christopher and Stella hadn't lived to see it, but Waldo definitely appreciated it. Well, except for the name. He didn't much care for the vagabond part. Everett, by now, had been venerated as a saint in his eyes, and vagabond had a bad connotation. For the book... The authors, Smith and Rusho, asked a few other authors to write forewords, but only one accepted. And it was actually put as an afterword. Which is funny, because before I even wrote this episode, I had decided to end this episode with a few paragraphs from Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire. It just so happens that Smith and Rusho also closed their book with Edward Abbey. Except he wrote them a poem about Everett, and it's lovely. I will repeat it for y'all. Quote, you walked into the radiance of death through passageways of stillness, stone and light. 
gold coin of cottonwoods, the spangled shade, cascading song of canyon wrens, the flight of scarlet dragonflies at pools, the stain of water on a curve of sand, the art of roots that crack the monolith of time. You knew the crazy lust to probe the heart of that which has no heart that he could know. Toward the source, deep in the core, the maze, the secret center where there are no bounds. Hunter, brother, companion of our days, that blessing which you hunted, hunted too. What you were seeking, this is what found you. Everett lives! This is the theme of a unique festival in Western arts to be held in Kanab, Utah, June 15th and 16th. That was the flyer for the first ever annual Desert Vagabond Days in that small Mormon community on the border of Arizona that is Kanab in 1984. The cult was rising. During that first ever event, Waldo himself rode on a float in the parade through town during the festival to honor his brother. I'm going to read from Roberts, who sums up the awesome-sounding festival. Quote, The festivities, mixing rodeo and art festival, included a square dance, a doll show, a horse show, a special Everett Ruiz exhibit, a kaibab squirrel celebration, and a highway sign shooting competition. The festival was repeated in June 1985, again centered around Everett, but adding such events as a horseshoe pitching contest, jackpot team roping, a Western cooking contest, and a fun shoot. End quote. Ah, this is what they took from us. I miss the before time. In 1985, Gibbs Smith, one of the authors, commissioned two bronze plaques, and one was to be placed at Dance Hall Rock, which is right off the Hole in the Rock Road. It's where Mormons had some dances while they were blowing up the Hole in the Rock. Uh, The other plaque was to be in Davis Gulch. The BLM okayed the plaque for Dance Hall Rock. The NPS shot down the plaque for Davis Gulch, which is in Glen Canyon. When it was time to place the plaque, Gibbs Smith, Bud Rusho, Waldo himself, and Pat Jenks, a man I mentioned a long time ago, he would be nearly as old or older than the 75-year-old Waldo at this point, But Pat Jenks was one of the two young men who picked up the very thirsty Everett near Cameron Trading Post and then took him to the ranch near Flagstaff. Well, he, Waldo, Rusho, and Smith, and 20 other early Everett enthusiasts and believers made it to the spot and placed the plaque, the spotted dance hall. The first plaque was a success. At least until some cultists stole the plaque a few years later. Man, you can't have anything nice. Despite the NPS saying, no plaque, some youngins among the crew went down Davis Gulch using a rope ladder and placed the plaque instead of screwing it in, but they placed the plaque among the sandstone crevices and canyons. As of the publishing of Robert's Finding of Ruiz, it was still in place, but I believe now it has been moved to Boulder, Utah, and it is at the Burr Trail Outpost and Grill. Waldo would live well beyond those years at the fairs, and he would die at 98 years old in 2007. And what a life he lived. His brother would have been very proud. But now, all the Ruises were united in the next great adventure. In 1987, though, a wonderful year for Earth, Waldo sold the rights to Everett's woodblocks. And in the first 11 years after that sale, the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, who had bought them, took in over $88,000 in sales from the prince. But the cult was growing. One of those prints is the Everett Leading the Burroughs silhouette I borrowed as the cover for this series, although I did alter it just a little, so it wasn't quite copyright infringement. Although you will notice in this episode, Everett is missing from the cover. In 1989, a man named Bruce Berger wrote an academic paper about Everett and his travels. The cult was continuing to grow. In that paper, he'd write something I believe to be true, 
and something that resonates with so many people today, especially as the place explodes in popularity. It certainly resonates with me, owner of the website and podcast, The American Southwest. Berger wrote, quote, Ruiz was almost the first to travel that country not to prospect, to herd cattle, to scheme a railroad or escape from the law, but simply to relish it, to absorb it, and to shape that love in the arts. End quote. Shortly after that, a Pulitzer Prize winner by the name of N. Scott Momady wrote, quote, Of all the myths that pervade the American landscape, None is more pervasive than that of the solitary man whose destiny it is to achieve a communion with nature so nearly absolute as to be irrevocable. It is the act of dying into the wilderness, actually or metaphorically. When Everett Rubis disappeared in the Escalante wilderness of Utah in November 1934, he succeeded to that mythic ideal. He became one with the wild earth. End quote. More serious filmmakers would begin writing scripts with serious people attached, but it would take a long time for something to appear on screen. But still, the cult was growing. The first real screen time Everett ever achieved was in the year 2000 by the filmmaker Diane Orr, whom I've talked about before. She, for some reason, was convinced incorrectly about some of Everett's feelings And in the film, she straight up portrays him as homosexual, even though Waldo begged her not to and said that years of late night conversations in their bedroom they shared when they were young, and not to mention letters between the two, proved that he was indeed not gay. Regardless, Hollywood is going to Hollywood. And not only did this filmmaker turn him gay, but she made him split with his parents, which never happened, as you know if you've been listening to this whole series. It's just so stupid. That's like Netflix-level stupid corruption of the story, honestly. Predictably, Waldo hated it. Even after years of correspondence with Orr, she stabbed him in the back. I will never be seeing that film, I can assure you. A year before that filth was made, a documentary apparently nobody watched called Vanished was made for TV. It was actually directed by the daughter of Dorothy Lange. She was the one who took Everett's picture way back in San Francisco. She also took that very famous picture of the woman during the Great Depression. We all know the one. Author David Roberts says the final product of the TV movie strayed even further than oars from Everett's life. Another piece of entertainment I will not be watching. Why do people do that when somebody's life is already so interesting? I will never get it. I mean, on the one hand, you want to make entertainment, but on the other, Everett's life was incredibly entertaining and amazing. And he wrote so well and described so many scenes so well that I have practically been there. I mean, I have been there. I was there when he got stung by the bees and nearly died. I was there when he found the necklace at Canaan de Shea. I was there when the Manco swallowed the horse and the camera and journal and blanket and everything was soaked I was there when he traveled through the Chuska Mountains and saw the storm. Why stray from his amazing life? Why make him gay? Why make him break from his parents? This family, the Rubises, were so incredibly close, it's absolutely beautiful. They're a role model to follow for a tight and wonderful family. Why ruin that? Why ruin him by turning him into a... I don't get it. I really don't get it. In the 2000s, two apparently bad detective novels were also printed around the mystery of Everett, and a full-length play was written and performed in Salt Lake City in 2008. There have been songs written about him. A website now sells Everett's prints and poster, postcard, and magnet form. And today, humble little history podcasters whisper 70,000 spoken words into the void about Everett, his life, his mystery, and the cult. So what happened to Everett Ruiz? In 1998, the author that I oft quote from, author David Roberts, actually set out on assignment for National Geographic to find out just that. Could his remains, Robert thought, be found after so much time? The desert, after all, is not forgiving. Yet, 
it can sometimes be preserving. Like everyone, Roberts started in Escalante before hiking, backpacking, and exploring the Hole in the Rock Road, the Escalante River, and its many tributaries. But his start in Escalante would prove to be rather fortuitous. He actually uncovered that the xenophobic Mormon residents had lied to earlier journalists, writers, and cult members about the true findings all the way back in 1935. And he only found this out because by then, 1998, the people involved, especially the main person involved in hiding the truth, he was dead. He died just the previous year. That man was the man in the first search party who had discovered the burrows and the camp. Gail Bailey. It turns out he'd taken the burrows long before the search party, and he'd found the camp long before them, too. And everyone in town knew that if he found the camp, Mr. Gail Bailey would have taken the stuff, including his journal. But, as author Scott Tibbany wrote, quote, By designating the incident a murder case, anyone who might have taken some of Everett's gear or personal items became a suspect. If one of the searchers had appropriated a Dutch oven or a saddle blanket as compensation for the time and effort invested, he now had to keep it secret. And anything identifiable as having belonged to Everett would have to be destroyed or risk incriminating the person who possessed it. End quote. Roberts writes in Finding Everett Ruiz, not the National Geographic article, but he writes of this taking of the stuff. Quote, Gail Bailey died in 1997. By the next year, when I interviewed the old-timers, they no longer felt the need to cover up the rancher's prevarications, nor did they stint on judging his character. One local, Dan Pollock, told me, Gail Bailey was a nasty little son of a bitch. But Delane Griffin, who was sure that Bailey had appropriated Everett's belongings, told me, Gail Bailey couldn't have killed Everett. No way. All this left me wondering just what had really happened. In terms of the discovery of the burrows, and possibly of Everett's camping gear, painting kit, and journal. Later, I would hear the same persistent rumor that had reached the ears of Mark Taylor two years before me, that Everett's belongings were still kept inside the house of a long-time Escalanton, and that others had seen the stuff. Whether or not the alleged thief was Gail Bailey, I could only guess. It was clear, however, that there was a limit to how deeply any outsider would ever be able to penetrate the workings of Escalant society. End all quotes. How much? I'm not sure. But I do imagine the town of Escalant by today, 2023, I believe it has changed a little, probably a lot, since 1998. Although, I hope not too much. I mean, my wife and I love that town. And the Escalante Outfitters Pizza, which I guess is Escalante Outfitters Pizza, it's, it's amazing. King's Mesa, by the way, is the one to get. And the baguettes from down the street. Oh, and the incredibly nice people we meet every time we're there. I kind of want to shut off this recording and head there right now. It might be getting a little too cold, though. But, I mean, regarding what David Roberts found, what a bombshell. The stuff, including the journal, could still to this day be an Escalante. If the owner of the journal is listening... Please donate it, you know, secretly to the Utah State Historical Society, or you can mail it straight to me. You can trust me. I'll only look at it for a minute and then I'll give it right back to whoever needs it. I promise. But Tibbany could also be right. And the evidence is long gone, burned in a fire, buried in someone's backyard. Nobody wants to go to jail for liberating a missing person's belongings. After sleuthing through Escalante, Roberts meets up with a longtime Utah buddy, and the two of them track down a man named Ken Slight, who I have mentioned before. He is the desert rat who influenced Edward Abbey, and who talked with John Krakauer. He was a true desert rat, uh, and he loved the Colorado River, and had been up and down it more times than he could count. He was passionate about the Southwest, and about Everett's story, but like, in a good, healthy way. After the meeting, Ken Slight told Roberts and his friend how to find the Nemo Scratch at Grand Gulch, which is east of Davis Gulch. East of good ways, by the way, through seemingly impossible canyons. And lots of them. So they eventually get there to Grand Gulch, and they do see it for themselves. And 
They can't tell if it's a forgery or not, but they do have a discussion with Slight who says about it all, quote, I think a copycat would have put it where you could see it better, end quote. Uh, he then goes on to offer this about Everett's fate, quote, He couldn't cross the Colorado River with the Burroughs, so he decided to take a side trip. I think he wanted to make a round trip back to Davis, but he underestimated the distances. He wanted to see Grand Gulch. John Wetherill would have told him all about it, the mummies they took out and all. I think Everett made it over to Grand Gulch, but by then he was real tired and hungry and he didn't make it back. I'm not so sure about him drowning in the San Juan anymore. There's lots of ways he could have died. I don't know if he had it in him to really explore. I think he was playing Captain Nemo, going down with his ship. End quote. I, just, I don't know. I mean, I wrote here to suggest that I'm not convinced, but maybe I am convinced that he got all the way over there and then made it back. But as you'll hear shortly, there was an ill-timed rainstorm that may have done him in. So I don't know about this Grand Gulch one. It could be possible, but I think as of this recording, I'm going to say it is a forgery. So, but then there is, there is the fact that Ken Slight discovered the Nemo in the 60s, which was some 20 years before any printed version of Nemo existed in the world. So if Ken Slight was the one who scratched it in, how did he know what it looked like? And remember, I mean, the The original Nemos were underwater by the 60s. So how on earth did this Nemo get here? How on earth did the wandering Everett make it to Grand Gulch if he did? I mean, I just, I had to head over to my Four Corners map and look at the distance between, well, and the distance and the terrain between Davis Gulch and Grand Gulch. And I'm in awe. I mean, if he really did that. There are so many canyons, it's tough to even... Describe how many. It doesn't seem possible. That being said, there is another Nemo out there. And it is in Davis Gulch. And it is not underwater. What if a person who discovered that and didn't tell anybody, and studied it and copied it, was able to reproduce it? I'm not saying the Grand Gulch Nemo is a forgery. I don't know yet. I I think it might. But I am saying there's another Nemo in Davis Gulch. And we will talk about it soon. There's more to this Grand Gulch business and petroglyphs and Robert's exploring it. And if you're interested, you should read his book. Back in Salt Lake, author David Roberts, in preparation for his book, pours over documents. He looks for clues as to who could have killed the vagabond, as that was his leading theory at the time. People connected to Ruiz and Escalante were still refusing to talk. One local man even said, quote, too many of the folks that might be incriminated, they still got kids and family around. It don't do nobody any good. I just can't help you. End quote. But one man did agree to an interview. A Norm Christensen. I actually quoted him around the time Everett disappeared. He remembers Everett waving as he rode away the morning he left Escalante forever. Well, Roberts was interviewing Christensen and he asked him straight up, quote, so what do you think happened to Everett? End quote. And here is Norm Christensen's response. Quote. Christensen's dark eyes held mine as his face clouded. I know what happened to him, he said quietly. He was shot. The man who did it told me. End quote. I'm going to actually just continue to quote from Roberts because it's a bombshell. Quote. I was stunned. In measured tones, Christensen went on to recall an afternoon, sometime around 1949 or 1950. Several young men had gathered in Christensen's barn to drink. One of them was Keith Riddle, nine years Norm's senior. Riddle and Christensen sat on a plank in one corner of the barn, out of earshot of the others. Drink had loosened the older man's tongue. We were talking about old cowboy stuff, Christensen recalled. I said, Keith, just between you and me, what do you think happened to Everett? He looked at me and said, I killed the son of a bitch, and if I had to do it over, I'd do it again. I didn't say another word. I figured I'd pushed it as hard as I could. Keith was a very strong-willed man. 
He'd fight you at the drop of a hat and drop the hat himself. If he liked you, he'd do anything for you. If he didn't, he'd have liked to knock you down and kick the guts out of you. I drew a long breath. Could it have been a drunken boast? No, said Christensen. It wasn't said in a bragging manner. I believe Keith told the truth. A flashbulb of corroboration was going off in my head. Russo had claimed the last man to have seen Everett alive were the two sheep herders at Soda Gulch. But Melvin Alvey had insisted that after parting from Clayton Porter and Adlin Lay, Everett had met and camped overnight with two cattle ranchers, Keith Riddle and Joe Pollock. I asked Christensen why he hadn't gone to the authorities with Riddle's confession. There was nothing to be gained by telling on Keith, he answered. He'd served his country well in World War II, and he'd herded sheep and cattle all his life. End all quotes. All right. Is that the answer? What if he was shot, and that was that? Why? Why would anyone shoot Everett and call him an SOB? Roberts wondered the same thing. So he began digging into the riddle that was Keith Riddle. Allow myself to introduce myself. Riddle was born in Escaland in 1915 as one of eight children. He was then raised by his mother on account of his father up and leaving the whole lot of them. Then came a cowboy named Joe Pollock who took Keith under his wing and taught him real cowboy stuff like roping and riding. Pollock had a spread way down the hole in the rock road southeast of Davis Gulch. On top of taking to being a real cowboy in that harsh land, it seems Riddle also took to drinking. A local Escalante resident in 1998 told Roberts, quote, When he got out of the service, he drank, and he was meaner and strict nine when he was drunk. End quote. On top of drinking, dang near everyone in town agreed that he and his mentor Pollock, way out there on their plot of land, also took to rustling cattle. Another Escalante resident who had seen Everett way back before he disappeared, a different Christensen, Christensen, not Christensen, but Della Christensen said, quote, Joe made a living stealing cattle. He'd go down in the desert, run cows off a ledge or shoot them, then take the calves. And Joe taught Keith how to steal. End quote. Again, the desert is just the land around the hole in the rock road. Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. If you've been to the area, it makes a lot of sense. All around you are just plateaus, mountains. And in the south is just a flat, sandstone, sandy desert. So Riddle was a tough SOB indeed, and he admitted to killing Everett. Where does the mystery go from here? Obviously Roberts goes further down the rabbit hole. And I'm going to follow him, and y'all are going to follow me. The man Riddle worked with, Pollock, he would go to trial three times for wrestling. But he'd only go to jail for it once, apparently in 1938. Riddle would have a son named Loy before dying in 1984 at 68 years old. Roberts tracked down Loy, who lived not far in Fredonia, Arizona, which is on the border of Utah. This is what Roberts writes, quote, Born in 1950, Loy could have known about the Ruiz matter only from tales his father had told him more than 20 years after the fact. Loy, of course, had heard the rumors implicating his father. Over the phone, he told me, On my father's deathbed, I said, Dad, if you killed the little guy, let me know where he's at, because there's still a $10,000 reward out on him. Tell me and I'll collect. Dad said, Hey, I never even met the guy. Loy believed that it was Gail Bailey who had fingered his father and Joe Pollock. End quote. Remember Gail Bailey? He's the one who was accused of taking all of Everett's things, including his journal. But Gail Bailey was also the head of the Cattlemen's Association, and the one who started the rumor that a Fed spy was wandering the hills looking for rustlers, which may have been the catalyst for killing Everett in the first place, if Everett was even killed at all. The mystery ever deepens. But it still remains that, a mystery. One we may never get to the bottom of. But we're going to keep digging. 
In Robert's book, he continues his search, although he realizes he may never solve the mystery, just like I kind of said. But he follows Everett's final steps around Pollock's plot of land and down Davis Gulch into the Colorado River. And he's searching for long-lost place names. He's searching for clues or answers to mysteries like the Unknown Footprints and other tantalizing stories that have come out since then. He walks from the Hole in the Rock to Lake Powell. And he imagines what it must have looked like before 200 feet of water covered it. Don't get me started. He finds some artifacts, surprisingly. And he finds something he cannot shake. Maybe an answer to the entire mystery. Maybe nothing. It turned out to be nothing. But it's still super fun to read about. But what turned out to be absolutely something was a phone call Roberts received in 2008 from another southwestern desert rat who had another friend who knew a Navajo man. And that DNA man believed he had just discovered Everett's body. This entire saga, in 2009, would find National Geographic magazine publishing the headline, Everett Ruiz Mystery Solved. Come with me on this wild ride into crevices, ghost sicknesses, and Navajos. In the 1930s, a Navajo man, Anith Nez, would look out over the land around Comb Ridge. Comb Ridge, that amazing place I have talked about before in other episodes, and I have been to frequently. It is amazing. It's a place filled with Anasazi ruins and even more ancient mysteries. Comb Ridge is actually a long line of uplifted sandstone that makes a wall across the land from south of Kayenta to behind the bear's ears. Well, one day in the 1930s, as Anith was surveying his land, he saw far below him, as a speck on the landscape, he saw a lone white man with two burrows, a sight he had never seen in that part of the Navajo Dineta before. Anith would see him at least three more times. But on the last time he saw him, he would see something he would never forget. The white boy was riding as fast as he could, and he was yelling, and he was being chased by Utes. The Utes and the Navajos were not friendly, by the way. They had not been historically, and they still weren't in the 1930s. The Utes being Udo Aztecan and the Navajos being Athabascan. But the Utes, they rarely came down into Navajo land, so this indeed was a very strange occurrence. Well, the story wouldn't end well for this white man, who would eventually be overran, chased down, and smacked right up alongside the head. The Utes then took the man's belongings, his burrows, and left. Anith, unsure of what to make of this, made his way down to the boy when it was safe, when the Utes were gone. By then, the boy was dead. So he picked him up, slung him over his horse, and carried him high up onto the ridge where he lodged the body in a rock crevice. Then, in 1971, suffering from cancer, and being told he got it from having ghost sickness by messing with that dead boy, the aging Anith told his granddaughter, Daisy Johnson, the story of the white man's death I just told y'all. And then, 37 years later, Daisy also suffering from cancer and believing it too was ghost sickness, would tell her younger brother, Denny Belson. Denny, who was friends with Robert's friend, told that friend, who in turn told Roberts. Roberts sums up what happened well when he wrote, quote, The medicine man told Anith that the only way he could cure his cancer would be to retrieve a lock of hair from the head of the young man he had buried decades earlier. Then use it in a five-day enemy way curing ceremony. I was 19, Daisy said. I was home for the summer. I heard Grandpa and Grandma arguing about something. Grandma said, You should have left him alone. Let him be. So I asked Grandpa, What are you talking about? He said, I'm going to tell you this story, and I'm only going to tell you once. That was the first time I had ever heard anything about the young dude the Utes had killed down there in Chinley Wash. Daisy drove her grandfather who had never learned to operate a motor vehicle, out toward the Comb Ridge in the family pickup. She waited in the cab for two hours, 
He came back, Daisy recalled, and said, He's still there. A few days later, Aneth drove out to the comb again with another medicine man. This time he retrieved a lock of hair from the grave. In the curing ceremony, Daisy explained, The medicine man dusted the lock of hair with ash. So it will never bother the patient again. On the fifth day, the medicine man said a prayer, thanking the spirits for making the patient well again. Somebody yelled, It's ready now. The medicine man put ash on the lock of hair, then shot it with a gun to destroy it completely. And then, Grandpa got better. End all quotes. By 2008, Denny Belson, the brother, had come to believe the Spanish had hidden treasure somewhere on his land. So, he spent most of his free time, much like his grandfather, intimately surveying and perusing the land. Although, Denny did it for quite different reasons. So he believed he could find, because he knew the land and because he had his sister's help, but he believed he could find where this white boy's body had been hidden all these years. It took Denny only two hours to find the hastily hidden body. At this point in 2008, not a single of the Aneth Nez clan had ever heard of Everett Ruiz, including the deceased patriarch. After finding the body, Denny would tell his friend in Utah, who would immediately remark that, quote, Gosh, that sounds a lot like Everett Ruiz. End quote. This friend would then lend Denny, the Navajo, a copy of A Vagabond for Beauty. And like that, the cult had another member. Denny would then call up Robert's friend, who I just realized I've never named, but this man's name is Vaughn Haddonfelt, and he immediately would head out to the area. Denny would take Vaughn to the site. He'd find an old saddle, stirrups, a belt, and a body. He'd take photos and he'd send them to Robert, and then he'd say over the phone, quote, Hey David, I think you ought to take this seriously. What if it really could be Everett? End quote. Next thing Roberts knew, he was being financed by National Geographic Adventure to find out if it truly was Everett. When I began reading and thinking and writing about Everett, I had no idea the mystery would truly be this exciting and interesting. I just loved his life. But I mean, this is an amazing unsolved murder mystery, and people love that stuff, and now I understand why. So Denny, somewhat knowledgeable of the history of white men being killed on Navajo land, I guess, he called the FBI, in case it was a crime scene. Yeah, you never call the FBI. Well, Roberts talked to the agent who knew Denny on account of him having previously found other bones, bones which always turned out to be Anasazi. And those bones were found in a place my wife and I have been to that shall remain unnamed, but... At the end of the conversation, the FBI promised to visit the site, check it out, and most importantly, handle it all with care. Thankfully, before the FBI showed up, one of Robert's friends was paid by National Geographic to go take pictures, which he did. Extensively. Then... The miracle that is the FBI showed up and utterly destroyed the scene. Completely. Never call the FBI. You asked for miracles, dear. I give you the FBI. So Roberts, his friend Vaughn, and Denny would hike out, look around, see the destruction the feds wrought, and lament their presence. Roberts would ask questions, and Denny would answer. Then Roberts asked him, quote, Denny, is it dangerous for you to be here? It is, he answered right away. Doesn't matter if this guy is white, Mexican, or Navajo. It will probably affect me later. I thought about that. Why are you willing to take Vaughn and me here? I want to find out who this guy is. Denny stared at the crevice. Well, he sure picked the loneliest place to die. I was impressed. Denny had been doing his homework. End all quotes. Afterwards, National Geographic gets more involved, an archaeologist is called, and again they go out to the trashed scene. 
the archaeologist concludes, it was in fact not a Navajo burial, despite what the FBI thought. Since the body wasn't facing east, well, kinda, maybe. Then, Denny asks him, as he had asked Vaughn and Roberts, but Denny asks the archaeologist, whose name is whose name is Maldonado, he asked him if he could smell the bones. Quote, Maldonado sat up, towel in hand. Yeah. You can smell them even when they're a thousand years old. It gets into the dirt. It's a smell you can never forget. This guy I used to work with calls it people grease. End quote. I do not personally remember smelling people grease when I was in a small enclosed space in the jungles of Belize working with long dead humans, but maybe I wasn't aware I should have been looking for the smell. Maldonado, the archaeologist, then sums up the situation that Aneth, the Navajo, may have found himself in. Quote, It all makes sense. The 1930s were a really volatile time on the reservation. The government had started wholesale livestock reduction, killing thousands of Navajo sheep and cattle. They were hauling the kids off to boarding schools. Here's an Navajo guy who witnesses a murder. Your grandpa. Maldonado nodded at Denny. Doesn't want the remains just lying out on the ground. In the 30s, if a white guy gets killed on the res, they call out the cavalry. Round up a bunch of Navajos, pick a suspect, and lock him in jail. I can see why your grandpa would have tried to hide the guy. And then I can see why he wouldn't tell anybody about it for 30-some years. End all quotes. Now I do have to say, that sounds like it may be true, or it may have been the case in the 1930s, but remember how I just told y'all about how the judge tried to get Jack Crank and John Chief the least amount of time, and how he had hoped they would get off on appeals? It's so easy to project non-existent things onto the past, even for educated people like this archaeologist. Up next in this saga, David Roberts and National Geographic needed Brian Ruiz, who is one of Waldo's sons, also one of long gone Everett's nephews, but the crew needed him to offer up a sample of DNA. They were going to compare it to that of the bones, and the DNA would ultimately prove a possible match. So the rest of the bones would be carefully dug up. They too considered a match. His facial reconstruction, match. The age, match. The sex, match. The time period after finding artifacts, match, match. It all matched. Case, freaking, closed. They had found the wandering vagabond. Everett Ruiz could now be put to rest. The cult could now celebrate his life instead of his mystery. In May of 2009, the New York Times printed the headline, A Mystery of the West is Solved. The Los Angeles Times wrote, The Mystery of Everett Ruiz's Disappearance is Solved. Tucson Weekly called Everett the Kerouac of the Canyonlands, and they said he was found. Papers in Germany, England, and even Russia printed that the mystery was over. The Ruiz nieces and nephews, they were on board. Even Bud Russo reluctantly agreed the story was, well, it was over. National Geographic proudly claimed to have funded the finding of the answer to the question we've been wondering this whole series. Everett Ruiz had somehow been killed by Utes and then hastily shoved into a hole in the rock, quite far from the hole in the rock. After leaving his burrows there and going from that spot across the river over to Grand Gulch, getting two more burrows, and then going down the Comb Ridge. And that's what happened, right? You know what wasn't found in the teeth of this Comb Ridge man? Two inlays and one gold foil. Why had Everett leave the burrows? Why were all of his clothes, and all of his jewelry, all of his accoutrements, why were they all so obviously Navajo? And you know what? It turns out he was facing east. The FBI may have trashed the scene, but they were 100% sure it was a Navajo burial. 
Besides, how come after his parents got the word out to everyone, and I mean everyone, how come no one reported seeing him? Not a single cowboy, rancher, trader, Indian, Anglo, rustler, prospector, agent. No one saw him. That's a huge country for him to have passed through without going into town at all. He refused the food from the two at Soda Gulch before he disappeared because he had plenty. I mean, not enough to last a year, but he had plenty. He'd have gone back into Kayinta eventually. And he would have stayed a bit and talked with his old friends and acquaintances. Someone would have had to have sold him two new burrows. Unless the Utes took the burrows they stole from him right back to Davis Gulch? No. And why did he have a saddle? Well, maybe that was Anith's saddle, but... I mean, speaking of Anith, why had the Navajo man handled the body in the way that he did? That was quite a Navajo of him. Questions began to pile up almost immediately. Doubts crept in. Author Scott Tibney, who knew and was friends with David Roberts, wrote, quote, A large quantity of colored beads and a few turquoise pendants had turned up during the excavation, along with a Navajo-style belt and buttons made from Liberty Dimes. No item found with the burial could be linked to Ruiz. He goes on. Another concern was the location of the burial. The remains were found in, in an area with other Navajo burials, 125 miles by trail from Everett's last known camp. End quote. Tibony also finishes with the fact that in order for Everett to have pulled this off, he would have had to have avoided every single person in that vast territory, something he had never done before and frequently did the opposite of. He liked people. Despite writing that the Lone Trail is best, the trail and everyday life are two different things, even for Everett Ruiz. In June of 2009, only a couple months after the article printed, an archaeologist for the state of Utah named Kevin Jones wrote an article on the Utah State History website titled, Everett Ruiz, A Suggestion to Take Another Look. And in it, he poked holes in the conclusion from a dozen different directions. He clearly thought this was an older Native American male, not a young white boy. And why had they treated the burial in such a way with such disrespect? And what about the teeth? His criticism gave the Ruiz nieces and nephews who were planning to cremate the bones and then spread the ashes in San Francisco Bay, like, very shortly. His articles gave the Ruiz his pause. And then, they cut Roberts out of the picture. For a bit. Until, in September of 2009, Brian Ruiz called Roberts and loudly proclaimed on the phone, quote, It's not Everett. In fact, even worse, it's Native American. End quote. Uh-oh. Apparently, the Ruizes had taken the DNA sample to the AFDIL in Maryland. That would be the group that specializes in finding family members of deceased soldiers by using the tiny fragments left over after battles. The AFDIL is the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory. They had tens of thousands of blood samples. They knew what they were doing. In their tests, they found only one of 17 markers that matched the Ruiz's male lineage. All 17 should have matched. They found no exact match in the entire vast database, but they did find three males that came very close, and all were American Indians. A month later, Brian Ruiz would issue this press release. Ruiz family accepts Combe Ridge remains are not those of Everett Ruiz. The bones were then reburied elsewhere in a safe spot that wouldn't pass on ghost sickness. The media responded by saying, The mystery lives on. The Utah State archaeologist had an article written about him titled, Skeletons in the Closet. Utah State archaeologist Kevin Jones knows his bones. <laughs> That's a really great title. And David Roberts, the author, would be absolutely devastated. Not that he was wrong. 
he wrote, but because of what he put everyone through and for how they treated the burial. Unfortunately, much like Christopher Ruiz, Stella Ruiz, and Waldo, Waldo's children shared their same fate in being dragged along for a wild ride of hope and answers and ultimately a crashing letdown when it came to their beloved Everett Ruiz. At least this newest saga was in genuinely good faith, though, unlike so many other endeavors that their grandparents and father had endured. It seems only Bud Rusho had been successful in the family's monumental desires to have Everett Ruiz remembered well. But the cult is still truly alive. And I think Finding Everett Ruiz by David Roberts is a fantastic read, and it too helps keep the cult alive. And now, thanks to this podcast and my dear listeners, I hope it will only continue to grow. But not because of the mystery, but because of Everett's life. And like an Anasazi spiral... The story keeps getting tighter and deeper into itself. We're not quite done yet, but we are almost there. Unfortunately for author David Roberts, the ghost sickness that so haunted many in Navajo and that Denny was afraid of getting, it also visited him. In 2009, around the time that the devastating DNA test would overturn his discovery, David Roberts awoke in his office in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the very deep and dark middle of the night and he had to go to the bathroom. He was an old man. Being late at night and all and being groggy, Roberts mistook the basement door for the bathroom door and, much like our vagabond for beauty may have done, he fell into the void and down the stairs before laying in a broken pile at the base of them. He suffered a fractured skull broken ribs, broken vertebrae, and a collapsed lung. And then to make it all worse, he contracted a staph infection, which was followed by life-threatening renal failure. Denny Belson, the Navajo treasure hunter, who discovered the false Everett, told Roberts, quote, You've been messing with Everett Ruiz's bones. End quote. After the 2009 reversal of fate, and after healing from his nearly fatal wounds, Roberts continued to get clues to the ultimate fate of Everett. First of all, even Brian Ruiz believed that Aneth's story is probably true. It's just, Denny found the wrong burial. He found an actual Navajo burial. Not the one where his grandfather returned to for a blonde lock of hair he needed for a curing ceremony in the 1970s. Aneth may well have witnessed a murder, and then hastily buried the body before sundown in an obscure crevice at Combe Ridge. It just may not have been Everett's murder. Although, Everett may well have left his burrows, taken his stuff, crossed the river, made it to Grand Gulch, carved the Nemo, and then was heading down Combe Ridge. A logical direction, actually. And then he was murdered by two Utes. Also in 2009, Roberts learned from a desert rat friend who had heard from a Navajo man who worked for the BLM that it was known among some Navajo that Everett Ruiz had a name, and that name was Hosteen something. And the name is translated as the man who walks with burrows. And this man who walks with burrows stayed under a tree near Navajo Mountain for years. He actually regularly met with the Navajos too, allegedly. Then a year later, I'm telling you like a spiral, a year later in 2010, Roberts met with a cult member who was a software engineer during the week, Desert Rat Explorer on the weekend. His name was Greg Funseth. And Greg had discovered yet another Nemo 1934 carving. This one on a sandstone wall on the opposite side of Davis Gulch that everyone and their brothers had been searching since 1935. Greg was probably the first person to see this carving way back in 2001. Besides Greg's wife, Roberts was the first person he ever told. It turns out this carving, in an extremely remote area off Hole in the Rock Road, is genuine. Enter Scott Tibbany. Oh, wait. He's already entered the picture because I've quoted him quite a bit in this episode. 
I read his book after writing this whole series, essentially. So I had to go back and insert some of it into this final one. Great book, The Disappearances. But Scott is actually a celebrated author, Desert Rat, and Everett aficionado all unto himself. And on this 2010 trip, he accompanies Greg Funsith and David Roberts to the newly found Nemo. Here's Scott Tibney's description of what happened next. Strap in. It's exciting. Quote, Relying on friction alone, the three of us angled down a slick rock face toward a sandstone knoll. We entered the main chamber, crowded with breakdown and the matted sticks of a pack rat midden, the dust untracked. I scanned the back wall and saw, more than six feet off the ground, an inscription reading, Nemo, 1934. End quote. So back in 2001, Greg Funsith joined the cult of Everett Ruiz, and whenever he could, he'd head to Davis Gulch and look for the intrepid adventurer. And then, one day, the former rock climber spotted an unusual sandstone knob, which he figured was the perfect place for Everett Ruiz to want to explore. As if to confirm his suspicions, nearby were a set of moky steps that led themselves right up to the little opening. He followed those steps in the sandstone, entered the cave, and found the Nemo. Now, Scott had some reservations. How had it been missed for over 75 years? And why did the inscription look completely unchanged? And he acknowledged that some Nemos had been faked. Now, when I read that, I immediately thought of the Grand Gulch Nemo. But he does not specify which Nemo has been faked, so, I mean, I'm still wondering about the veracity of that particular Grand Gulch Nemo. Scott Tibbany writes this of what happened next in the cave. Quote, I stooped down to peer through a circular passage in a stone bulkhead leading to the next chamber. Entering the room, I found a domed ceiling and a rounded opening framing Davis Gulch as much porthole as window. It gave the room a nautical feel, like a ship's captain. If ever it had made it this far, he would have found himself in a familiar setting, having sailed with Captain Nemo many times while reading his worn copy of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. An old fire ring and a few pieces of firewood indicated someone had camped here long ago. End quote. Could that have been Everett's camp? And that's why I said earlier that I think the Nemo is referring more to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea than it is referring to Odysseus. After returning to Flagstaff, Scott Tibbany began digging in his own files because he remembered hearing in 1991 about bones being found in Davis Gulch in the 1970s. But he couldn't find any evidence with the National Park Service that they had the bones, or had ever heard of them. So he decided to track down the man who'd been given the bones, way back in the 1970s. This man's name is Roe Barney. And this is what Tibbany writes about this most intriguing of all threads. Quote, Roe told me he was motoring across Lake Powell in a Park Service boat when a gentleman from California flagged him down and handed him a sack of human bones. The visitor had just returned from Davis Gulch, where he had been looking for Indian ruins, something he said he often did. He had left his wife and daughters on the boat and walked up the creek. The Californian spotted a sandstone knoll on top, which appeared to be a good location for a ruin. Finding a way out of the canyon bottom, he headed toward it. He reached a broad ledge and, looking behind it, saw bones wedged deep within a crack. He scaled in with a rope and saw indications of a broken hip and fractured collarbone. Leaving most of the remains in place, he took a few of the bones for identification. He placed them in a sack along with his name and turned it over to the ranger. Being curious whether they were prehistoric Indian or more recent, the Californian asked to be notified once they had been studied. Right away, Roll told me. I thought about Ruiz. I had heard stories about him growing up. Upon returning to headquarters, then located at Wawiap, he gave the bones to his supervisor, and at that point, they disappeared. Rereading the notes, I saw similarities in his description to the knoll with the Nemo inscription. End. Quote. 
So wait, had Robertson, Greg, and Scott Tibbany actually been mere steps away from Everett Ruiz's final resting place? Are we going to get an answer to this mystery? Obviously, Scott had to return. This time, he brought a climbing friend named Tony Williams. The two located the same spot, they located the inscription, and then they entered the second chamber, the one with the nautical-themed sandstone window. This is what he writes about the scene. Quote, a stillness permeated the confined space, and a subdued light filled the interior. An ancient juniper had been dragged in for firewood, and a small ring of stones had been placed against the far wall, containing a scatter of charcoal mixed with sand. From the absence of smoke stains, it appeared to have been used for only a night or two. A flat stone, set on rocks, sat next to it for keeping things off the sand, an arrangement showing the work of an experienced hand. By the cliffside opening, a row of stones had been laid out for leveling the sandy floor wide enough for a single bedroll. The site contained no evidence of prehistoric use, not even a potsherd or chert flake. The most intriguing feature was a juniper root stool with a sandstone slab placed on top for a comfortable seat. It wasn't next to the campfire, but positioned to take advantage of the dramatic view of Davis Gulch framed by the rock window. It made an ideal perch for someone to sit and sketch the scene below. Everett had mentioned building a stone seat in one of his camps in Canaan de Chez, and sitting on the juniper roots, I was beginning to think of this as his camp. When Tony joined me, he was having similar thoughts. I'm assuming, he said, this was his last stop. End quote. So there are a couple more long quotes before we wrap up this episode in this series, so stay with me. From the small alcove with the perfect view of Everett's most desolate spot, the two, Tony and Scott, discovered a nearby vertical crack where some of the cliff face had separated from the rim. It kind of looked like a spot where Anasazi and ancestral Puebloans could have been, and Scott realized, from the creek bed below, the Californian would have thought the exact same thing. And then, to add to the scene, Moki steps were carved into the wall below it. Scott writes this about the explorer's next moves. Quote, As we began to traverse across the slick rock face above it, I noticed hermatite concentrations covering the micro-ledge we followed. Known as Moki marbles, they made the footing treacherous. A wrong move could result in an accelerating slide of 25 feet, ending with a free fall into the sandstone crevasse. Tony and I had enough experience scrambling on slick rock to know when to back off. End quote. So then the following morning, they had a rope, their harnesses, and they were ready to explore the ledge which sat below the angled slick rock that ended in the nearly fatal drop. This time, though, only Tony would rappel down. Upon coming back up, he told Scott, quote, This has to be it. Everything fits. End quote. They discussed what they discovered, and they came to the conclusion that it's very possible that when the Californian had grabbed the bones, he may have loosened what had remained of the skeleton, which would have quickly been flushed out of the crack and washed away down into Lake Powell with every storm and downpour. The following year, the two returned, but it was Scott's turn to rappel down. This is what he found. Quote, Once off rope, I worked into the wider section of the crack along a slanting floor. It had a slot canyon feel to it, perpetual twilight. Cliff walls pressing close, a fissure of sky above. The crevice was two feet wide, where I entered, and sloped downward to a narrow crack. The far end flared open at the top to form a rock funnel and pinched down to only four inches wide. I shone my headlamp to the bottom fifteen feet below and realized any pieces of bone would have been lost in the interstices of the crack system. Backtracking, I climbed onto the spall and studied the slick rock slope above. Anyone taking a slide down the face would hit the ledge I was standing on with enough force to cause major injury. 
if not death, before jamming deep in the crack. The more I studied it, the more the entire configuration of terrain and circumstance had a compelling fit. I could see the incident playing out clearly. Distracted by the beauty around him, the explorer's attention may have wandered for a second as he stepped on a loose rock or a thin ledge snapped underfoot. Suddenly, he was in a slide, unable to arrest his fall before going over the edge. In an instant, the rock swallowed him, leaving no trace. End quote. Uh, then he goes and he continues. Quote, the slick rock of southern Utah, mostly Navajo sandstone, provides good friction for scrambling until it gets wet. Then the footing becomes slippery, and the thin bedding planes, normally solid, can crumble under weight. Whenever it headed south on the Hole in the Rock Trail, a three day rainstorm broke a long drought, increasing the hazards. End quote. Oof. The disappearing steps at the edge of the cliff, the possibility of ruins being there, everything seemingly adds up. But there are no more bones in the crevice where the Californian may have found them. There are now no more traces of the vagabond for beauty. And when the time comes to die, I'll find the wildest, loneliest, most desolate spot there is. Eventually, you have to put down the books, close the magazine, close the browser tabs, and you have to go look in yourself. Even if you don't find Everett's remains, you'll find exactly the feelings he felt as he wandered freely throughout the greatest part of the world, the American Southwest. And I think that he would be truly happy if that were the legacy he left behind. The legacy of exciting people into exploring the wilderness. In today's world, I feel it is increasingly important that we get out and we enjoy the outdoors. It doesn't necessarily have to be the American Southwest, although if you do plan on going, let me know and I can help you out. But it doesn't have to be my favorite places. It can be any place near you. Only a few minutes outside your bubble or city, there is landscape. There is beauty. Maybe even more than you can bear. It's important that we see the earth, feel the heat from a small fire we made, in a pit under a canopy of twinkling stars and planets. It's important we move and see and feel the dirt and sand, and smell the pure air that's stirred by the wind through the trees, to hear the bugs, to hear the water trickling through a stream, to hear the wind, to hear nothing at all. It's important to sleep outdoors. These are vital to being human. We have forgotten them. This is necessary for being a creature on planet Earth. Recently, a rather famous American figure went to Hungary and gave a speech. Uh, this was in August of 2023. And in this speech, this man talks about what we as humans are missing from the modern world. And he is absolutely right. Whether or not you agree with the rest of him personally. I'm essentially paraphrasing what he said... But basically, he said, if you live in a place where you can see the sky and make your own food, if you can go outside and identify trees and hear birds or experience silence, which is the rarest commodity in the modern world, if you can do that, maybe you can hear higher voices. If you're stuck inside all day, glued to a screen like a prisoner or an industrial animal, if you're trapped inside, you're, quote, enslaved and you can't think clearly and your reference points are gone and you can't see the stars and you can't see the trees and you can't see God's creations. Your ability to make clear judgments and think rationally goes away. End quote. Tucker's right. Everett, in all his fantastical poems and letters and journal entries where he said he had seen more beauty than he can bear, I wish we could all feel that and see that. I wish we could all experience nature so gorgeous it makes us weep. It takes our words away. It takes our breath away. We're missing this in the modern world, and it's changing our DNA. And not for the better. We should all ultimately strive to be a little more like Everett Ruiz. In the epilogue to Finding Everett, 
David Roberts writes, quote, Gibbs Smith, the publisher of so many books about Everett Ruiz, may be right. It is not the mystery of Everett's disappearance and final fate that makes him so interesting, but his achievements by the age of 20, as a precocious artist, a writer of promise, a romantic visionary verging on the mystical, a bold and resourceful solo explorer of the wilderness, and in some sense, the first true celebrator of the beauty of the Southwest for its own sake. Everett traces a unique and meteoric path across the American landscape. The cult that has accreted around him since he headed into Davis Gulch serves as the ultimate proof of how Everett's wild quest captivates the minds and hearts of his legions of admirers. End quote. I hope the cult grows, in a healthy way, of course. I hope more people find his words and find the desire to explore safely and smartly, obviously. We don't want to end up like Everett, just like how Everett could have ended up. That's how we should want to. As Stegner in Mormon Country writes about how Everett did the things I just pleaded with you to do and how it leaves us in awe, he writes about that. Quote, The peculiar thing about Everett Ruiz was that he went out and did the things he dreamed about. Not simply for a two weeks vacation in the civilized and trimmed wonderlands, but for months and years in the very midst of wonder. End quote. But I do have to say, if it's all you can do, you should go out in the trimmed and civilized wonderland. At least it's still land. It's still wonderful. You just may find more beauty than you can bear. I will close this series on Everett Ruiz and his mysterious disappearance with a quote from Edward Abbey's much-read and loved Desert Solitaire. I believe Everett would have approved the words within. Quote, Behind the dust, meanwhile, under the vulture-haunted sky, the desert waits mesa, butte, canyon, reef, sink, escarpment, pinnacle, maze, dry lake, sand dune, and barren mountain, untouched by the human mind. Even after years of intimate contact and search, this quality of strangeness in the desert remains undiminished. Transparent and intangible as sunlight, yet always and everywhere present, it lures a man on and on, from the red-walled canyons to the smoke-blue ranges beyond, in a futile but fascinating quest for the great, unimaginable treasure which the desert seems to promise. Once caught by this golden lure, you become a prospector for life, condemned, doomed, exalted. One begins to understand why Everett Ruiz kept going deeper and deeper into the Canaan country, until one day, he lost the thread of the labyrinth. Why the old-time prospectors, when they did find the common sort of gold, gambled, drank, and hoarded away as quickly as possible, and returned to the burnt hills and the search. The search for what? They could not have said, neither can I. And would have muttered something about silver, gold, copper, anything as a pretext. And how could they hope to find this treasure which has no name and has never been seen? Hard to say. And yet, when they found it, they could not fail to recognize it. Ask Everett Ruiz. Thank you for listening. And I will see y'all again soon in the American Southwest. The Sound of Rushing Water by Everett Ruiz Then there will be no music but the sound of rushing water that breaks on pointed rocks far below, and the sighing of the wind in the pinions, a warm wind that gently caresses my cheeks, ruffles my hair tenderly, and wanders downwards. Alone I will follow the dark trail, black void on one side and unattainable heights on the other, darkness before me and behind me, darkness that pulses and flows and is felt. Then suddenly, an unreal breath of wind coming from infinite depths will bring to my ears again the strange, dimly remembered sound of the rushing water. When that sound dies... All dies.